we make a number of mistakes around here every day. And so one of the things that we got wrong the other day is that we did not cover baseball and its trading deadline very well, although we did give you some Juan Soto analysis as Bruce Springsteen singing. We did bring you that. But now David Sampson is back from Africa. The trade deadline was busy. I think Billy's broken. I'm not sure because uh, the Marlins uh, didn't do anything. But let's start overall, uh, David, with Soto and just what the Padres are doing and what the Brewers are doing. I was really surprised that they traded Hayter. So just tell me your overall thoughts as, uh, as a busy time in baseball came and went. When the new collective bargaining agreement was signed and expanded playoffs happened, which means that there is a third wild card team and they got it, they finished with the one game and done. Owners hated that. In previous years, the wild card games were one game and you could win or lose and then you're done. You could win 100 games, play a wild card game and lose, and owners did not like that. The new CBA allows for a two out of three series now, all in one park. It starts this year. And what the commissioner thought is that teams would change their behavior because of expanded playoffs, that more teams would be in the race. They'd feel they were in the race and they would govern and act accordingly. Well, after one trade deadline, we've learned that actually nothing's changed. The sellers were the sellers, the buyers were the buyers, and the smartest teams were the ones who were not the delusional teams. I want to talk about the Brewers to start with because they were the far more interesting team. David Stearns, is one of the top three most respected and best president of baseball operations in all of baseball. Christian Yelich on the Brewers is one of the best players in baseball, at least used to be, but one of the least understanding of what goes on in a front office. When the Marlins made the moves that we made when we had Yelich, he'd be very upset and I'd have to talk to him and he would be... Uh, He'd misbehave for a period of, of days or, or weeks, and I'd have to explain to him why we're doing certain things that may not work, but here's what we're trying to do. That same conversation had to happen with Yelich when the Brewers traded Josh Hader. Josh Hader is their closer. Josh Hader was the person on the first place team who was supposed to get them to the World Series, and David Stearns traded him to the Padres. Why? because they've got another closer, Devin Williams, who did give up a home run last night to the Pirates, but ignore that. They've got a closer ready to go. They got other players who are gonna help them keep their window of winning open longer. That's what you want as a front office. If you are a Marlins fan, if you are a Brewers fan or an Orioles fan, you want the window of opportunity to be open for as long as possible. And the Brewers made an unpopular move because they weren't gonna listen to the media. They weren't gonna listen to their players. They weren't gonna listen to their fans. They were gonna listen to their baseball executives. And that's something I never did. What does it look like when Christian Yelich is misbehaving, like you said? Doesn't, doesn't go to community appearances, doesn't sign things that he promised to sign, doesn't do anything other than what's contractually obligated for him to do and does it when he's pouting. He and I have spoken about this since uh, when he was influenced so badly by a former player named Jeff Baker when he was younger and much less mature. He's totally changed. He is now a... Uh, the leader in the Milwaukee clubhouse. He is a leader in the Milwaukee community. But when players are young, whether you're Yelly or AJ Bennett or anybody, it's when you just become a surly teenager and players just don't understand what it is to run a team and you try to explain it to them, but they just don't get it. But the Brewers needed to have a team meeting and they did after the hater trade and they were told why that trade was made and it was the single best trade of the deadline was the Brewers trading Josh Hader. That said, though, David, uh, I don't understand how anyone ever hits Hader, and it cannot be disputed whether he gave up a home run or not last night, that it's going to be almost impossible to be as good in that position as they were with Hader. Well, Devin Williams is the one who gave up the home run to the Pirates, and he is as good as Hader. And Hader, you have to look at what the player is making, and you have to look at the fact that Bullpen pieces are fungible. You do not want to allocate 10% of your payroll to a closer. It does not make sense. Trust me, tried it. It doesn't make sense. You have a much better chance of having a different closer each and every year, especially when you don't have a payroll that's 200 or $250 million. Devin Williams for the Brewers is going to be just as good as Josh Hader. No, he's not. That's he where, is. no, no, come on. He is, he is, Dan. David, David, Hader. I, I, I don't know what to say to you. Hater I is okay. Your love of baseball, uh, Jessica was a, a little slow there because it, it's she's groggy and it's early in the morning. But please. 
Samson said, don't, but I did it anyway, Miss B. Haven. Thank you. I, I, I did not understand she sang that it, at all. She sang it in my ear, and I was delighted, and I wanted to hear it on air. So I appreciate that you did that, running around the house with a pickle in my mouth. <laughs> you mentioned uh, John Baker. You mentioned John Baker earlier. Who was the worst guy in the clubhouse who influenced young players negatively? So now I'm beginning to worry, Roy. John Baker, not the catcher, who's the awesome guy. Was it Jeff Baker? There's There was a utility guy. The backup Jeff catcher. Baker. Wait, wasn't Jeff Baker a backup no, catcher? No, no, that was John Baker. Oh man, this is fun. <laughs> this is. I think John Baker was the backup catcher who was this really good looking Jeff athlete. For John. I don't even think Jeff Baker knows who he is either. Jeff Baker is, was the negative influence. Jeff Baker was the uh, shit disturber on the team who we signed to be a bat off the bench, sort of like Wes Helms, and the, he just was a total disaster. The, the bat off the bench can't be the shit disturber. Like, just can't, I, just cannot correct. be. Oh, yeah, That's Jeff we Baker. Him. We got him from the Rockies. I remember that guy. Oh, but you didn't, answer, you, you didn't answer uh, Roy's question, or is Baker the answer? No, that is the answer. He was the biggest shit disturber. Now, listen, Tom Kohler was a disturber as well, uh, but he did it with a good heart. Um, Barry Bonds was a terrible disturber. For, the worst coaching shit disturber we ever had was Bonds trying to work players up and trying to get them to ask for more and do more. Heath Bell was a terrible disturber. He would go into the training room and say, what kind of cheap-ass organization doesn't have a cryogenic chamber? And then we had to buy one which was ridiculous because it didn't help his performance or anybody else's. So a disturber <laughs> is someone. Chubby. <laughs> <He> was, <laughs> we missed but Puerto why didn't Rico you, why didn't you have because one, of though? bonds. Because it was a waste of money. It was yeah. It's silly. It's that thing you go in for, to for 20 seconds and you freeze yourself. And it, I've said Roy cryogenic. It. It's not oh, you've silly. You've done that, Roy? But it's not silly. It helps the body heal. I did, but it, I wasn't hurting. I was it, paying off a bet. It increases <laughs> it increases the, the your it helps your immunity system and it, it helps blood flow to flow to areas that need healing. Our owner was convinced. We the GM said no, I said no. The player then went to the owner. The owner said have it installed by the end of tomorrow. Another thing about Jeffrey that people don't get. Everyone, my head, the reason I'm 5'5 five five is that my head got stepped on so often by players who went right to Jeffrey to get what they wanted because Jeffrey would never say no to players. Ironically, he would never say no to all the different gadgets and things that the players wanted because they would convince him that it was going to help them win games. What's the best example of something someone went over your head on? Yeah. Uh, Puerto Rico. Playing in Puerto Rico? Yep. I thought it was important to play in Puerto Rico. I liked playing internationally. I liked playing and getting attention uh, by, by playing the international games. And players do not like doing that. They want to get paid extra money to do it. They're inconvenienced to do it. And one year when Bonds was the coach, we had a Zika outbreak. I don't know if you guys remember that. It was sure. something called Zika way before COVID. Um, and it was, this, it was this disease that if you were going to get pregnant or pregnant, then you had a potential problem. We had a team meeting, which I didn't want to have. We brought in doctors, which I didn't want to do. We had a doctor who the players knew. We had a doctor who we wanted. And we addressed the team and talked about the risks of going to Puerto Rico and how they were de minimis and we should go play. And Barry Bond stood up and said, if I were you all, I wouldn't go to Puerto Rico unless they paid you more money. I kicked him out of the clubhouse. <laughs> I screamed at him and I went to talk to him. I said, you are not permitted to address the players ever. You are now management. You are not a player. You do not hold the sway that you think you hold. But guess what? Between him and Craig Breslow, the Yelly, who was on the team at the time, who explained to all of the players from the Dominican who were having sex with various people who could possibly get pregnant, saying, you're going to have a problem and it's going to cost you extra money if your kids are sick or your wife or your girlfriend, if anyone's sick. The players voted not to go to Puerto Rico. I had to call the commissioner's office and say, we're not going to Puerto Rico. And that's the truth of what happened, of why that trip was canceled. I have other questions about times that you have felt most quickly. I don't know if you got Dominicans were the only people having sex. Listen, we can talk about the, the the mechanics of a clubhouse anytime you want, and and we could rank who has more sex when and how. I'm happy to do any of that if you think it's either good content. How or would you know that? 
uh, when you're in a clubhouse for 18 years, you Is see Is there like it all. a daily thing where everyone comes in? Like, I had sex four times last night. You, everybody, put it on the board. Um, it's as close to that as I'd like to tell you, especially on the road. Billy, you got us here. Any follow-ups? No, I kind of like Barry Bonds more now, honestly, yeah. after some of these stories. Everybody. He would not behave yeah. like management, but I don't mind someone who doesn't behave like management. What, but when you're in management, you have to behave like someone in management. Otherwise, you shouldn't be in management. Except That's he was, the role except you play. He was Barry you, Bonds, and he was in management, and he got a giant salary because they went over your head, and Loria wanted Barry Bonds, so then he was in management. I. Uh, he was actually just empowered by that. The reason why I didn't have a lot of sway with Bonds is because he knew that all he had to do was call Jeffrey and he'd get whatever he wanted. He'd get his own suite on the road. He'd get his own transportation to and from hotels instead of being on the team bus. He'd be able to do anything he wanted. He'd get money paid under the table, uh, which we lied to Major League Baseball and to the San Francisco Giants about when they asked Larry Bear asked me straight up, the former president of the Giants, what are you paying Barry Bonds? And I lied and told him we were paying him like $350,000. And uh, I'm sorry, Larry. Why'd you lie to him? Uh, because under Perry Hill's contract, who was another one of Jeffrey's favorites, who got to do whatever he wanted, Perry Hill had to be the highest paid coach. That I love was the that contract too. that Perry Hill signed with Jeffrey, not with me or Larry or Mike. Therefore, we couldn't violate that contract. So the coaching contract with Bonds had to be lower than the Perry Hill coaching contract. But Barry Bonds wouldn't come unless he were paid more than Perry Hill. So in order to pay him more than Perry Hill, we had to pay him from a different entity completely off the table. Wait a minute. Perry, one, Perry Hill had the Nick Saban contract, which is crazy. Two... <laughs> You violated that contract, so now you owe Perry Hill a ton of money. Yeah. Oh, bring it, Perry. I dare you. Bring it. <laughs> why Why are you now threatening Perry Hill, who did nothing? And an honorable, Bones. An honorable Perry man. Perry Hill did more to, to, to hurt the Marlins in his time there than just about anybody wow. player or coach that we had. What? Examples? I mean, he, you may think because he has great PR. Does it remind you of Jeter, someone who has great PR, but it's it's like the Wizard of Oz? Perry Hill has great PR as being the best infield coach of all time. Go ahead and ask players. Luis Castillo gave him one of his gold gloves, I thought. Because Luis Castillo was told that he can't sell the gold glove. He was also too busy having sex and as, Dominican, one, of, yeah, as one of those Dominican, Dominicans. Yeah. He was too busy to concentrate on any of this stuff. Don't make this about race. <laughs> what? I, not, I didn't make not. it about, I didn't, ha I didn't know how many Mac how Mexicans, Dominicans, Colombians were having sex in your lock, in your clubhouse. You brought it up. Nobody asked you that. You volunteered it. Moving on. <laughs> Who is the second most damaging behind Perry Hill? <laughs> Uh, sorry, but yes, it was you, Mike Berger. Oh, Mike Berger. I love him listening. Yeah. Like, don't say me. Don't say Mike me. Mike Berger's right me. there. He's, on the, it, he's on the treadmill right now listening to the I podcast. They're he's all been listening because they all listen. <laughs> Mike, you know, you know, I'm sorry. I flew to Pittsburgh to fire you that time, but I told Jeffrey if he didn't fire you, I was going to quit and he chose me, but then he chose you after. Do you remember when we rehired you? And you know what you did. And I don't blame you. When you have a direct line to the owner, you use it. I get it. You use it. I have a number of follow-up questions, but this is the first I'm hearing. Perry Hill has a pristine reputation. So when Roy says example. With like, who? I, man, I've always thought so highly of Perry Hill. And when I talk to other people now, admittedly, a lot of my information on Perry Hill is coming from other reporters and reporters really like Perry Hill. I haven't. Why do reporters like Perry Hill? If I, you had to guess. I, well, he's affable, kind, available, helpful. Uh, and he's just a, he's, he seems to me. A he looks like a monopoly man. A yeah. decent man. What's the word that you just glossed over as do you remember your days of being a reporter? How about the word helpful? Have you ever wondered how people get good reputations with the media? Because they leak the most stuff to the media. Okay, so that's why you're saying he's disruptive when Roy asks you for examples? Uh, he's disruptive because when he didn't get what he wanted, he would go right to Jeffrey. The common theme is the common theme. The most disruptive people are the people who didn't respect the chain of command and who did not care about anything other than getting everything they wanted and knew that Jeffrey was going to give it. So you're angry because he broke the org chart, basically. 
We went over your head. But is that their fault or, or Jeffrey's fault for allowing that to happen all the time? Great question. It's mostly Jeffrey's fault. But I have spoken to those people who are taking advantage of Jeffrey's desire to win and of his desire to be liked by people. And I've explained why I'm the hatchet man. And I've explained to people from Felipe Alou all the way to Don Mattingly why I play the role I play. And how come 97% of the employees were willing to follow the correct chain of command, to communicate with me or with Larry or with Mike what was going on to communicate with me when Jeffrey would call them at 2 a.m. with a trade proposal and then they would respond, yes, let's do that trade. And then we'd get a call the next day saying, we're signing this guy or trading for this guy or we're signing Salt to Lamaki, whatever the case may be. How come 97% of the employees were respectful and Salty. communicative and 3% weren't? We are so into this, Billy and I. Like the rest yeah. of us are so into this right now because of the names that are popping up. Jessica has no idea what we're talking about. Mike Berger, the, the, Saltamachia. Who the fuck is Barry Hill? Barry Hill. <laughs> he's a, God, that makes me so happy that you said that. He's a he's an infield coach who was uh, infield famous coach. as being one of the best infield coaches in all of the baseball. The Nick Saban of infield coaches. Still is, is he not? He's still in the. He's still playing, is he not? Or he's still coaching, rather? I have no idea. I, I believe he is. Was there anyone else that you, besides Mike Berger, anyone else that you went to Jeffrey and like him or me? <laughs> or her well, or me? So you can't do that every Monday to Dunnestick, right? You can't every day walk into your owner and your boss and say, hey, if you don't do what I want, I'm going to I'm gonna resign. Uh, so you have to save it for when it matters. Uh, and it happened with, uh, it happened with Mike Berger and uh, it happened with Dan Jennings. And the response to the Dan Jennings was, not only are we not getting rid of Dan Jennings, but we're going to make him the manager. And then after that, we're going to fire him. Perry Hill is the infield coach up in Seattle. Of course he is. Uh, I've got a lot of questions, and it seems like Billy and Chris do too. It doesn't seem like I do too. Jessica. Who is Dan Jennings? <laughs> wow, he is, uh, the former general manager of the Marlins, the former VP of player personnel for the Marlins. He worked for the Rays, uh, and he now works for the Washington Nationals as a special assistant. He was also the manager for a little bit. And that's a good one. Jessica, that's a good story. (laughs) Like that, but this, one of the reasons I love this hour, there are a number of reasons I love this hour. The information is impeccable and nobody tells you like that. Yeah, I had to lie here and this is how we broke the rules with Barry Bonds. But when you ask that question, it's a good question to inform the national audience that doesn't care about any of these people. The Dan Jennings story is amazing. Like that guy weaseled his way through your entire organization because he had the owner's ear, right? He was the one who was brought in. Ironically, he was hired by Larry Beinfest, ironically. And he ended up, uh, you know, being very difficult with Larry. Not be, not his own fault. I love DJ, but he didn't know what to do with the power he had. I don't think you understand when you've got the boss's ear, how powerful that can be. And power in the wrong hands leads to pain. And there was a lot of pain in the Marlins organization because of the misuse of power. Can you explain to Jessica why it is? I thought it was Berger. Berger is number two on your list here. Berger, not Berger. Okay. Can you explain to me why he was number two and to the audience who he is? So the connection that you'll find between all these people, it's very simple. You can look at the Jeffrey Loria tree. It's quite simple. He used to own the Oklahoma City 89ers, which is a AAA team for the Texas Rangers at that time. And now I don't know, they're not even called the Oklahoma City 89ers, and I don't actually know uh, where they're the AAA team for these days. But in any case, he was a AAA owner, and I did not work with him. I was working in Europe or, or at the time, or on Wall Street, and, um, or maybe it was law school, whatever it was, doesn't matter. It was the Texas Rangers farm team. Perry Hill was in that system. Mike Berger was one of his players. Wayne Rosenthal, the World Series winning pitching coach in 03, who took over when we fired the pitching coach, is was a player for Jeffrey on the Oklahoma City 89ers. All of the people who work for us with the Yankee connections, the Oklahoma City connections, the Texas connections, it's a very simple line to draw. And you can see that when you've got a relationship with Jeffrey, he is loyal. Marty Scott worked for Jeffrey back in Texas and then worked for him in Florida. Marty Scott, the guy who the Marlins, when Jeffrey sold, did not take care of Marty, who recently passed away, sadly. Loyalty is something Jeffrey had which greater than anything. Believe it or not, with all the firings he did with managers, the loyalty he had to front office people was unparalleled. 
And people took advantage of that loyalty and that's too bad. And Dan took advantage of it a lot and he knows it and we've talked about it and we're at peace. We have a great relationship. We've done a lot of great things together, but he knows that he did things that he looks at in the rear view mirror and he and Jeffrey don't talk now. We finally got it. So he and Dan don't talk by making Dan the manager. So what's Jimmy hot dog up to these days? <laughs> Who's that? I don't know. Mike Berger was on the same team yeah, as him, I think. Yeah. Wow, that needs the loser game show. That's a good sound. one. No, that was a good joke. That is not. And a where's good Paul Jardinera? You got to go Frankfurter. It's a funnier word. If you're gonna go, if you're gonna go hamburger, I mean, it's so bad. Yeah. Wait, is she making up names? Uh, yes, hey, the, the Frank. No? Uh, can you play for me, please? I meant to say this when uh, when Samson, I want to get better at using this sound. When Samson said the Brewers will be as good at closer with Hater, get that Do sound. Do you not know Jimmy Hot Dog was a made up name? <laughs> Bologna. 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 Samson, Billy's asking you a question. Did you think I was, Jimmy I was Hot Dog? To did you think that Jimmy Hot Dog was like a a nickname for somebody that yes. uh, that Jimmy Butler had a nickname and his name was Jimmy Hot Dog? Uh, I thought it was either a character from Goodfellas or a player. I was not going to get Sid thrifted. You were not going to do that to me on this show. That's too old a reference. Nobody knows what you're doing there oh, with the on. former Pirates right, general manager. Go ahead tell and tell the up names. Well, go ahead and tell the Sid Thrift story, but now you're going into the 80s. It doesn't matter. The story is what informed me how to be a president of a team. When you do an interview, Sid Thrift was a general manager of a team. He went on a radio show, and the radio show host said to him, we really like this player, John Cocktoston. What do you think of him? Sid Thrift said, we love his stuff. He's got two very workable pitches. We're developing a curveball for him. We think he's got major league potential. We look forward to him being on our team. It was a made up name. Yeah, it's a great story. And Sid Thrift was unwilling to say, I don't know that player because he thought it would be too embarrassing. Wait a minute, what, I am not embarrassed to say when I don't know, when I'm asked about a minor league player, I've never heard of all the minor league players in our system. Okay. I would just say, all I don't know. David, sorry. Okay. You thought Jimmy hot dog was a real person. It's okay. <laughs> yes, I did. What, what okay. was his name again? John who? Uh, it's Sid Thrift. And the, what was the name? The made up name. Do you remember the made up I name? I just used John Cocktoast to me because that's the made up name <laughs> I use for everything. <laughs> so what, hold on. I want to ask this question. What? For what? When, when you need a, hotels? When, when, when you need a made up name, tell us when do you need a made up name and when does Jimmy Cocktoast in? When does he make an appearance? <laughs> Tell us, we want to know more about Jimmy Talk. The name that I would it. check into hotels with was Jay Trotter. That was my name. Jay Trotter is the character from Let It Ride. That's the Richard Dreyfus character. John Cocktoson is the character from Fletch. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's the name that you're using because uh, yes. it's just funny to you. Okay. Correct. So this is great. We're doing Fletch and Sid Thrift talk here. We're, we're, we are killing it right now in 1988. How the hell did you get off Kilimanjaro with a broken leg or whatever you had? Like, how are you here today? Yeah. So I still have a torn hamstring. I'm going to a doctor today. I did make it to the summit. If you Google Guinness Book of World Records highest trail race, you will see my picture in the Guinness Book of World Records as having completed a marathon from the summit of Kilimanjaro. Uh, the, the, um, I, I did it, I just kept going. It took 12 hours to do the marathon. The, to summit the mountain took five days plus a six and a half hour hike that night, the night before the marathon to get to the start line. So it was an 18 hour race altogether. And uh, I just kept going, I just kept going. I gotta teach Samson how to vacay, man. You're yeah. always scaling mountains, saving the world. Just go to a beach, man. Put a drink in your hand. Yeah. Listen to some Jimmy I mean, Buffett. He, he, he's a crazy person. And you guys were asking the other day, I'd be curious what his answer is to do you enjoy running? Because this show came out against running. And well, I wasn't here. I'm pro running. I know. It was I'm the stupid. Only one. It was stupid. But Anti. But David, very few people, I mean, I shouldn't even say this because a lot of people are like David, but it, they're crazy. These ultra marathoners and these people who beat up their bodies. And I told David he shouldn't be going on any of that. No, never mind. He the, the dude is literally climbing Kilimanjaro when he should not have been walking around. Quite the supportive friend you are. I mean, it's, yeah. it's idiotic. What he did is idiotic. Like it's not, I don't know what kind of pain he is in now, but when you ask the question, how did you scale Kilimanjaro with a 
broken leg. Like, don't do that. So Levitard, when when I f- crossed the finish line and I had posted a picture of me at mile 24 of the marathon, Levitard texted me saying, you're idiotic. Goodbye right? forever, he didn't David. Say, Congratulations. He didn't say way to go. Talk about not being supportive. And it wasn't a bit because it was off the air. There was nothing for ratings, for listeners, for clicks. That was his version of communicating to me, was calling me an idiot for trying to do something that only 21 people tried and only 14 of us were able to complete. Those failures, what happened to them? Yeah. Uh, are, you, uh, are you mocking as not, as you keep going? Like, are you no, like, God, <laughs> you no. cowards? You're crying. You're not mocking at all. Out of the 21 people who tried to get to the start line, only 20 people even got to the start line. And of the 20 people who got to the start line, only 11 people got to the finish line. I don't think, okay, and forgive me for not being uh, gentle enough. Like, it is an accomplishment, and I admire your will. I have seen very few like it. Uh, You have an amazing pain threshold and ability to push through some of these things, and I admire it. But you were injured before you did any of that. And I would think that anyone who cares about you, even knowing you, even understanding you, would be worried about what condition you would come down that mountain in. So the only question I asked the doctors before I left is whether I could die. That was it. And they all said the same thing, that you're going to have a level of pain that you've never experienced, but there's not going to be a blood clot that'll break off. You could die climbing Kilimanjaro because people die because of altitude sickness, but because of your torn hamstring, that will not kill you. It's only a matter of whether or not you're willing to endure the pain. And if that's the only threshold, there's no way I'm not going to finish that marathon. So you say willing to endure the pain, and it brings up some follow-ups from early in this interview because you somehow became numb. I mean, president of a baseball team is a powerful position, but you somewhere along the line became numb to the idea of Heath Bell, no, I've made a ruling, and then by the end of the day, you have to go against your ego, pride. At this point, you're a janitor. You're not the president of a team. At this point, you're not a leader. You're just doing what a meddlesome owner is demanding of you against your wishes. How do you get immune to the pain, shame, or whatever of like, okay, I've been overruled again. And what's the greatest example you have other than Heath Bell of something that you went in on with conviction and six minutes later it had been overturned because he somebody went straight to the owner? Well, I had agents go straight to the owner. I told Mike Ryan during COVID the Dustin McGowan story when that's the most embarrassed I was in 18 years was the Dustin McGowan story who was a pitcher for the Marlins. And he had an agent and his agents were the Levinson brothers. And we called the Levinson brothers and said, we're not bringing back Dustin McGowan. And he said, what do you mean you're not bringing him back? We have an agreement. And we said, of course we don't have an agreement. We're, we're We're the president and GM of the team. It was me and Mike at the time. And we said, there's no agreement. And they said, well, we have a done deal. And uh, we've got the paperwork and it's all signed, sealed and delivered. And we said, well, we didn't do it. So it's not valid. What are you talking about? And they said, the Levinson brothers said, you may want to check your own house. Called up Jeffrey. Jeffrey denied it. I called up the Levinsons to say there's no deal for McGowan. 10 seconds later, Jeffrey called me to say there's a deal for McGowan. He had misled me and he didn't, he was embarrassed that he had done it behind our backs. We did not want to allocate the money to McGowan. It was only like a million bucks. It was nothing. It was ridiculous, but the principle was the same. And you're asking how it feels to your ego. I never even stopped to think about it because I had a team to run. So I've got, I have other things I have to do. It was just part of my job description was dealing with not just the owner, but you know, the janitor. I was dealing with thousands of people and I wasn't going to let anything stop me from doing my job and doing it as well as I could. But everyone's got constraints. If you ask the people in your studio right now, you think they all feel good about you as the boss, that they get everything they want whenever they want it? No, of course not. Although you did make me laugh when you told one of your stories because both Roy and Chris have gone on trips they weren't supposed to go on because they came up to me and just said, hey, can I go? And I was like, yeah, why aren't you going? Like, that's how that happened. They went like, I've probably embarrassed whatever is supposed to be our executive chain because- it's happened around here. Hey, or, man, we got you content. What are you talking remember about? Remember the hot whistle thing. I think we lost lots of money on all of those things. Oh. But the hot whistle thing. Yeah. 
do you make them explain financially why they take the trips they take? No, or they, no, I let them from no, a content no, standpoint. No, the business has to figure that out. We I, we are not good at the. I'm not good at the business part. We've got a business to business that out. But what I'm telling you is, when they've gone around the business, they just come and ask me. And next thing I know, I got Roy on the ice in Denver, and I got Chris Cody going to the Super Bowl when everyone in the executive chain said he wasn't going. And that's because you thought it'd be good content, right? No, it's just because Roy and Chris wanted to go. I mean, don't, don't downplay that content I made, baby. Uh, yeah, I mean, come on. No. The Ricky video. That's what yeah. I'm saying. I'm saying that, Dan, if you're in charge of content and what's good and bad, and Chris and Roy, and you believe in them, they're going to come to you, and you're going to agree with them if you agree with them. That's all Jeffrey did. He didn't do it to be mean to me or to make oh, no, me but feel lie, small. But, no, but lying to you is a different thing, David. Like, So you're now going back again and again, and you're, you just called it the most embarrassing thing in 18 years. It makes me want to do two top five lists with you today, both top five most embarrassing embarrassing thing, because I haven't heard that as number one before, and also just top five snakes in baseball. Just snakes. <laughs> I, I, mean, I Yeah, because there's since we're so going- so many. Yes, I know there's so many, but you're talking about all of these movements in the background. So I want to do those two lists with you, and I want to get to Soto, and I want to get to the Marlins. So we got a lot that that needs to be covered here. But where's the final point on the moves made yesterday, not made by the Marlins? And again, Soto to the Padres. I did not think the Padres could be the team of Tatis, Machado, Soto, young and good for 10 years, trade for Hater. Wait a minute. What do you mean the Padres want, they want to go at the Dodgers? What do you mean? They've been doing this for five years. The only, the, That's a small market, isn't it? That's the only pro team they've got. It's never mattered. Like them going for it against the Dodgers to me with a team for 10 years, it, I don't even understand how the finances of that work. Desperation is an amazing cologne in baseball. You've got an owner who's never won. You've got a market that's never won a World Series. And you've got a complex. The Padres were always famous. It was the Padres and the Mets in the ownership room who were the two famous teams for having the complex. The Mets always had a complex about the Yankees. Always. And the Padres have always had a complex about the Dodgers. And the Dodgers under Frank McCourt were more of a joke. And so the Padres did not actually have to do anything active. But once the Dodgers were sold and they got all that TV money and they were bought by Guggenheim Partners and they brought in Stan Kasten and Andrew Friedman and their payroll went to the sky, the Padres have had this desire to do whatever they could to be in the same room. It's the person who wants to go into the famous person's room and they rent a tux and they rent a dress and they're surrounded by people who throw away the dress and the tux at the end of the day because they've got 20 of them and they want to belong so badly, but you can't change who you are. The Padres don't belong in the same room as the, as the Dodgers. They will not ever be in the same revenue room as the Dodgers. They won't be able to win consistently the way the Dodgers do, which is why the Padres have signed players, then traded them, then signed them, then traded them. Does this sound familiar to anybody in the room? Chris, Roy, any of this? I mean, to your point, they made all these moves, bring Soto in, and they went from like eighth favorite to win to fifth. It's not like they jumped up to like the second favorite right now. No one, like Vegas still doesn't have them winning the World Series even with these moves. They will not make it to the World Series. They do not have a good, they're not as good a team. It's not like in basketball, if you trade for LeBron James, you're guaranteed to get yourself to the finals when he was in his prime. Just look at the Angels. If you can't, they can't make the playoffs with Trout and Otani, two of the top five players. Bringing in Juan Soto is a great, what was your expression? Lipstick on a corpse? Lipstick on a pig? Uh, breast implants on a corpse. Breast implants on a corpse is what the Worst signing- Worst possible of combination of those, all of those things. <laughs> yes, great analogy though. Wait a minute. No, no, no. That was Dan, not me. Right. I, I am I am saying that to Dan. It is okay. It is 20 years ago talking about Pudge Rodriguez's signing. Who the hell is that? Kick saving a beat. What? No, but what? <laughs> that's what it was. The joke is I said to Samson when they uh, this is how wrong I got it. When they got Pudge Rodriguez as a free agent for $10 million, a move that ended up getting them the World Series. I criticized the move by saying of the Marlins, the corpse, it's like putting breast implants on a corpse. <laughs> Do you know what happened after you said that? When I they don't. Won. They won the, you World, won the Series. World Series. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
Do you know that after you won the World Series, what Jeffrey wanted to do to you? He wanted to get you to, to do a public backtrack of the breast enhancements corpse comment. That can't be true. No. <laughs> it's like, I need a statement. A retraction. No. Did you do no. it? I wanted a total retraction. I don't think, I mean, you were hate. You're so, you and your radio show, your terrestrial old radio show, was so hated by everyone at the Marlins, not just because of my appearances, because of what players didn't like coming on the show. They thought you were going to corner them. They were told by PR people that you were bad to players. This is back in the day, Dan. And you were, as, as the Herald reporter, you were so critical for no reason. We had just gotten to Florida a year before. The payroll was then moving up. We sign a future Hall of Famer and you were critical just because you thought that that would sell papers, I guess. No, it's no, what, no, 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 it. no, it's what I thought. And then you won the World Series. Okay. That's it. But that's yeah. that's what happened. Like I I you guys had done a number. What do you mean I didn't have any basis for it? You guys had your whole history as carpetbaggers coming in. What <laughs> What did you think we were carpetbagging by signing Pudge Rodriguez? Oh, no, before that, with the whole history of the Expos and folding you mean the, Cliff the Floyd trade. No, I'm talking about you guys as What did we carpetbag in Montreal, Dan? Have you ever asked anyone about the Expos situation? You guys got out of Montreal. Why are we doing this? I'll do it with you. I've never talked. No, to you. I, no I've, I've never. We've never discussed I, this. But it is so I'm, you I'm, don't. You have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, literally. I, I'm happy to talk to you about this if you want. I think I it derailed. I'm it, not going to waste your time. It derails the segment. Uh, That's it. So move on. No, we're good. What you're you, right. We're carpet baggers. No, we went into Montreal just like we were accused of for the sole purpose of buying the Florida Marlins. You nailed it. That's we, not we, what I said. Yeah, I, we I did it. It's, it's bagged not, it. We bagged all of Montreal. Uh, just we desolé. Montreal hates you. You're one of the most hated figures in sports in the history of Montreal. Yes or no? Are you asking? We can call Ariel Hawani. Question you can, that you know the answer to. Yes or no? No, because I'm asking the audience. Because that don't. doesn't make the bottom line true. Just because I'm hated doesn't mean that people understand. No. Okay, so if you wish to explain how it is that you nope. didn't jilt Montreal and end oh, up God. here parlaying it in Florida into 1.2 billion dollars with the help of baseball using baseball money that you guys did not have to parlay whatever it is was the investment in the Expos into 1.2 billion dollars at the end here what am i missing oh just say yada yada and then everything will be okay you should have just texted him good luck climbing down the mountain david and <laughs> yeah. then this all would have been different <laughs> jeez do you want to do top five snakes or top five most embarrassing things to have ever happened to you i don't know you were doing baseball i assume you were doing that can't be number one on your most embarrassing overall list are you asking me the five times I've been most embarrassed in my life? Well, I no, I'm. It's I, very clear that two of them happened in middle school, <laughs> no, right? I'm asking you how this top five should look because we've already established number five, number one on most embarrassing. Do you want to just do top five snakes? No, I don't. I think it's. I want to explain to you because it's great click what a snake is in baseball because they exist in your corporation too. They're in Metal Arc. Just so you know, I've that. been married to one for 17 years. Like the way he sits very close to me or used to. Now he comes in and out. Is he even coming in today? He's in the kitchen with Amin. Yeah. <laughs> so he is. He's here. Yeah, with Amin in the kitchen. Yeah. He's physically. not yeah. in Lake Placid. No, no. he's here. Okay. Why? I thought he was in Cleveland today. Well, he's not in Canton yet. But is he going? I don't know. I got to tell you. Do you think that what Stu Gotts does is purposefully trying? to subvert the success of the organization of Metal Arc and of your show? <laughs> I mean, often it feels like that, yes. <laughs> like okay. That's a very important distinction. If that is truly how you feel, then you've got a problem. If you feel as though he's taking advantage of the relationship he has with you and trying to get as much as he can, as quickly as he can, and stretch the limit because you are a parent who says yes to everything and then wonders why your kid does crack, then that is a different story. Do you guys want to go get Stugatz uh, and to talk to him about this? Because you just, when I say that Chris Cody, I remember after it happened because I don't uh, run a business or have never run a business before. Did someone say snake? Um, Chris, when Chris Cody said I was reprimanded, uh, by people who work for me because they said to me after everyone in the company had said no to Chris Cody going to the Super Bowl, everyone in the company had told him, no, you're not going. He came to me and said he wanted to go. And I'm like, yeah, sure. You, you should go. That'd be fun. 
That'd be a fun thing to do. And then I remember telling Chris Cody this on the phone after it happened. Chris, yes, of course, great. Have a great time. You realize what's going to happen when Stugatz gets a hold of these keys, right? Like when Stugatz can come and ask for everything. And next thing you know, he's in Lake Placid, and now we're waiting to see if he's going to go be with Baselli or not. But I, I thought the flight was from Lake Placid to Canton. Like, why is he back here? How did he get back here? Did you guys Let's know? Let's just he was celebrate him being here. Yeah, yes. Here. Yeah, Thank you, yeah, Stu. Thank you, Thank you, Stu. Thank you, Stu. Thank you, Stu. Uh, it's called an airplane, Dano. So oh, wow. what's the question for Stugat, Samson, that he's just coming in here and uh, it is nice to see you. I'm happy it's a ha I'm happy and surprised that you're here. I was not expecting you today. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you. Do you feel as though, Stu, that you take advantage of the relationship you have with Dan and the fact that the show is called The Levitard Show with Stu Gotts, that you stretch the limits of what are, is appropriate for you to do and not do because of the relationship you have with Dan? Yes. Okay. That doesn't make him a snake, right? That makes him smart. He's honest. It's an honest snake. Yeah, smart, and, honest. And, right, that's debatable. He, and I dishonest. Like, I have amazing. a follow-up question. Would you do something that was to your benefit, but to the overall show's detriment? Yes. He did it yesterday, but he wins because the the bad was funny. Like the he the, was on vacation. I mean, but that makes sense. Anywhere without show. his bothering yeah. him, but, but, he, guy, man. but, he, but he can have vacation whenever he wants. Nobody's watching his vacation. Seems like he can't though. Yeah. That's why I keep taking him. I mean, but Stu, I, I I'd like you to really examine this question a little okay. deeper because right. what you're doing seems to be good content for your show. Yes, for everybody. Right, you're playing the role. Right. Would you do something in that role where you were told by Dan, that's too much. This is not good content, but you wanted to do it. Would you still do it? Yes. And what is the reason? Like like this weekend with Baselli. I mean, I have no idea what I'm doing. I mean, but I'm going to go and I'm going to charge it to Dano. I mean, how about that? You're not going. <laughs> Well, but you're not also charging probably it to not Dano, going. I mean, <laughs> right? You're charging it to all of the equity holders of Metal Arc. We support yeah. Stu. We yeah. love Stu. We, we love, love Stu. Stu. Yes, thank we you. It's a, it's a mutiny. We look love at, Stu. Look at what's happening here. It's a mutiny and I love right you guys. Um, yes, we all want to ride into the sky doing whatever we want. We don't want executives. None of us do. I don't know how you build a billion dollar company without having people in the front office who are willing to say no. I just don't know how you do it. We're not building that. <laughs> <laughs> We're building whatever Stugatz can get before it flames out. We're building trips. <laughs> We're building experiences, <laughs> vacations. That's right. I mean, Li life. We're a living. travel agency, We're really. Climbing yeah. note to really skip a travel or agency, Dave. 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 We're oh climbing you Kilimanjaro. You guys are in trouble. Yes. <laughs> oh, I know. Everyone knows real. this. <laughs> Everyone knows this. What is your mu movie of the week here? I wanted to get to Marlins with him. The Marlins didn't do anything, Billy. Bah. Yes, they did. Billy. Bah. They hey. got a prospect for two bullpen guys. I mean, what did you think they were going to do, though, Dan? Like, they were like they're 10 games under 500 I'm right glad now. they kept Pablo. Yeah, they kept Pablo. They didn't sell everyone. And why do you think they kept Pablo? Because they know that if they add a couple hitters, that can be a good one-two punch. Pablo can be a good one, a two number two starter. So that is exactly the reason, because they could have gotten a huge prospect haul. Pitchers, bats you trade in the offseason to really maximize, and people could argue, well, Soto got maximized, but that's obviously a much different scenario. Pitchers are maximized from bullpen side at a trade deadline. You get the most you can ever get for a bullpen arm at the trade deadline. The second most popular type of person to be traded at the deadline where you can get the biggest haul is a starting pitcher who's having a good year, who's got available time before free agency. And so you saw a lot of moves like that. Pablo Lopez is extremely valuable. And uh, if they didn't get the exact trade they wanted, they weren't going to do it. But I've got a different theory for you. I do not believe that Bruce Sherman would have approved any trade of Pablo Lopez because he would not have wanted to further the theory that they are not trying to win. Which is good, right? I mean, it's a step in the right direction. Listen, it, when we added every trade deadline, we got criticized because we traded young, good pitchers for bullpen arms who we thought would help us win. And it didn't work most of the time. So I, I don't know how owners and presidents ever win in the eyes of certain fans. 
Before we get to your movie, uh, Derek Jeter, have you, uh, while you were scaling Kilimanjaro, did you... Uh, Literally while you were scaling it, were you watching it? I can imagine that. <laughs> yeah, there's no Wi-Fi in Kilimanjaro. And so have you seen any of it? And I will not. Oh, you it won't? It is the most... It, it is anything that he was involved in producing is just going to be a puff piece that's absolutely full of it. And so I'm not going to learn anything. And I'm not going to be entertained by it because I know the real Derek Jeter. I don't want to watch watch the washed version of him. I know him. Jeter watched the Samson doc? Uh, the franchise? <laughs> that was a good show. No one watched that. <laughs> it was a good show. It was ahead of its time. That was ahead of its that time. That was ahead of its time. Tell me. T- Jessica's tell, like, what the tell, hell is the franchise? Billy, go ahead and tell Jessica what fr- the franchise that we've never had anything like that in South Florida. It was so revealing. They pulled the plug midway through. They're like, we it can't was, keep doing it this. It was too honest. Do you know why? That's not why they pulled the plug, folks. They pulled the plug because I was getting more screen time than Jeffrey and Jeffrey had them pull the plug. Oh, wow. Wait a wow. minute. Wow. Hold Amazing. <laughs> wait a minute. So you're saying you were getting more screen time than Jeffrey. So Jeffrey called Showtime and said this show's done. Um, there are several other things that happened. Couldn't he have just called the director and said, hey, put me on screen more? Did you and Jeffrey not have a good relationship? Does it sound like it, Bill? It sounds like you it didn't a have very, a great very one. very, tough relationship. Wow. Very tough. When you work with someone for 18 years, it's it's not going to be, listen, I was very fortunate to to get the job in the first place with the Expos. That was purely from nepotism. Yeah. But in order to keep the job, I had to do it well. And it was difficult to do well. Um, but I tried. But the other thing with the franchise is Larry Beinfest uh, never wanted to do it, and neither did Mark Burley, and neither did uh, Heath Bell. Several other players on the team were very upset that there were cameras everywhere. Johnny Hyde. And once the season started going south, the players went to Jeffrey and said, that's it, we shouldn't be doing this anymore. It is hurting our chance of winning. And we were not drawing the way we should have at a new ballpark. And the TV itself was exceptional. Nothing was staged. Nothing was redone or rehearsed. Every scene in that documentary happened as it happened with Ozzie Gein, with the players, with everything. And uh, but there was a lot of ego involved. Players were keeping track of how many minutes they were on the on the air in the final edited portion. Jeffrey was keeping track of how many minutes he got on the air of every final episode. He wanted editorial control over the final episodes and Showtime was not going to give him that under uh, David Nevins and Mike Tolan. Mike Tolan, who was involved in The Last Dance, it's the same, it was the same group of people who did the franchise. And uh, it was just a a confluence of events that led to the plug being pulled. By the way, there was never another franchise because MLB, other owners said, we're never going to allow cameras into our clubhouse because it will stop us from winning. Watch your movie, David. Uh, can we talk about the most hated man on the internet? Sure. It's your movie. Has anyone seen that documentary? No. No. <laughs> Just you. Okay. Yeah. I guess that that, I, for all the listeners out there, and if you're watching on YouTube, it's about a guy named Hunter Moore who started a revenge porn site called Is Anyone Up? And what he would do is he would get people to send him photos of former girlfriends or people who had wronged guys and send their naked pictures in. And he would post these naked pictures and to embarrass, that's revenge porn. But it turns out what he was doing was hacking people's computers and stealing their nude photos and then posting them without the permission of the girls. And he got in trouble. And it is a documentary about one woman who's actually a famous woman, again, if Levitard were here from the 80s, uh, who talked herself into parties all the time. Anyway, her daughter was found naked on this site and her pictures had been stolen. And she spent four years trying to get this guy brought to justice. And finally he was. It is a fascinating documentary because it is amazing what the internet has been used for. Obviously, we know the internet's for porn and that's how it started and that's where the money is even to this day. But when you are hacking and stealing private pictures and posting them and people are getting pleasure from that, uh, that's a problem. And he became the most hated man on the internet. Uh, David, we appreciate it. We will uh, we will speak to you next week. We're short on time. We got to run. Sounds like an interesting movie, though, and a creepy one. It makes me very happy to see your face.
<laughs> right, you know, I know you. I know you get uncomfortable about this stuff. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you that whenever I see your face, I, the first time I saw your face, I was afraid of it. I was walking around ac across that intramural field. You were wearing those too tight orange shorts, and I was too close to the field. I was just a freshman walking to my dorm, and you chased me off the field. And I've been afraid of you since. And everyone around here <laughs> is, Terrified, Jimmy. is afraid of you. Yes. Stugat's afraid of you. He's a 50-year-old man, Jimmy. And I keep telling people that you're you're more different than you've ever been, that there, there's nothing there to fear anymore because you're most, more changed than any human being I've ever seen in sports, what you used to be and then what you chose to be. Uh, so I'm thrilled that we're having you on. And I have to admit on the front end, I've got a shame on behalf of both me and my producer that Chris Whittingham went to bed last night mortified because he made the same mistake I made, which is to make it seem as if Jimmy Johnson was going into the Hall of Fame <laughs> this week. That started two <laughs> weeks ago with me when I told you we should get Jimmy on for the Hall of Fame. Yes, and what happened was we <laughs> tend to forget that we saw the speech that Jimmy's already in the goddamn Hall of Fame. Yeah. And, and so Jimmy very politely by email... <laughs> did not correct me and did correct Whittingham with a, hey, kid, I was in the Hall of Fame since last year. Fine. Uh, I, wa I wondered what you were talking about when you said how busy it was going to be this week. I said, it's not going to be busy at all. <laughs> Jimmy, when you responded Thursday morning, you'll join us. I said, there's no way Jimmy's going to join us Thursday morning. He'll be too busy with Hall of Fame stuff. Okay, so it's, <laughs> all right, so it's all of our faults. It starts with Stugatz and we didn't notice. So anyways, Jimmy, sorry about the fact that uh, we didn't already know you were a goddamn Hall of Famer, even though we knew you're a goddamn Hall of Famer. Thank you for making time for us. No, no problem. <laughs> um, you are. I've told people this before. I wanted to talk to you because I know you wrote uh, Swagger with Dave Hyde and went uh, to some deep emotional places that you don't normally go publicly. And so I wanted to talk to you about why you decided the, to do the book and and where it is that Jimmy Johnson decided late in life after Bearing Wayne Huizenga, after talking to him about quality time left, uh, why you decided to write a book about your life when you don't need any of this stuff anymore? Well, actually, um, Nick Kristen, who's, you know, along with Terry Bradshaw, you know, one of my best friends, uh, and he was my attorney, uh, you know, all the way back from my day one at University of Miami. He, you know, he talked to me about, hey, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. You need to you know, make sure, you know, the legacy is accurate. Uh, and, and then Dave Hyde came over, you know, just for a regular interview and he suggested the same thing. And you know, I said, well, you know, I, you know, I'm reluctant to do it, but once I got into it with Dave and we started retelling stories and, and, and talking about university of Miami and talking about Dallas Cowboys and talking about, you know, the Hall of Fames and all that stuff, uh, Survivor. Um, I actually enjoyed uh, doing it. And uh, it uh, some of it uh, was uh, somewhat emotional, especially the family things. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it's going to be a great book. You know, people are going to enjoy it. You say reluctant to do it. Why? Well, you know, I, you know, I, at this stage, you know, why, why do I need to expose myself? Why do I need to talk about our struggles? You know, why do I have to open up some of the problems we had with my family? Um, but, you know, you know, I, I really visited with my family before I ever did it. Uh, you you say this, uh, Jimmy, because, uh, yes, of course, you don't need people rummaging around in your personal life. Uh, you've you got out of the game. Good. Right. Like, why? Why show anybody any more than I already have? I managed to escape the thicket and the beast. Why show people any of my pain? But uh, but I remember I remember you being broken at the end of your dolphin tenure because when looking into your mother's coffin and seeing your sons at your side and telling them that you love them for the first time and sobbing in in their arms you're like oh wait a minute i almost let my life get away like football shouldn't matter like that well i, I think dan because it's a it's a success story uh it's a success story uh for my son chad um 
you know, of course, people want to know about, you know, my relationship with Jerry Jones and they want to know about my time on Survivor. They, you know, they want to know about the Texas Hall of Fame, the Arkansas Hall of Fame, the University of Miami Hall of Fame, the Florida Hall of Fame, the College Football Hall of Fame, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the Broadcasting Hall of Fame. <laughs> but all of that stuff, you know, it, it, that's a plus. But, but I, I think the most impactful part of the book uh, is my relationship with uh, Brent and Chad and Rhonda and them growing up. And and then I, I think the other thing, too, you know, we have had so many, you know, coaches, general managers, owners uh, throughout professional football, college football, basketball, baseball. They've all come down to the keys and say, hey, you know, talk to me about evaluating talent. Talk to me about you know, how you were successful, you know, in those stressful times. And so you know, that's why, you know, Nick Kristen said, hey, you need to write a book about all this stuff. You can look back on it now, couldn't you, Jimmy, and say you had to choose between football and family. You had to leave football to really have family. Danny, I, I, I think a lot of people are able to do it. You know, they're able to have a life other than their job. Um, I couldn't, uh, the, uh, you know, some of the most successful people I've ever been around, you know, their entire life is with their job. Um, you know, you know, I, I look at the successful people, you know, look at Wayne Heising. I, I, I know, you know, when Wayne and I talked about it there at the end, when I tried to retire a year before I actually retired, he said, Jimmy, he said, I understand. And uh, he said, you know, a lot of times people will call me and, and play golf. Here the guy's a multi-billionaire. And he said, I, I don't play golf during the week. I got I got work to do. I've got to oversee some of these companies I have. And I'm thinking, geez, you know, <laughs> the guy's worth four or five billion dollars. You know, why can't he take a day off to go play golf? But I think some of the most successful people I've been around, they work at it night and day. That's why they're successful. Uh, I couldn't go home at five o'clock and have dinner with my family. You know, I, there was always something to do and I had to oversee it. Jimmy, is there anyone that comes down there just a little bit too much? Like, <laughs> just like, oh, this guy again. You I mean, had, you had, Gene Hackman's been in the guest house. Who, who else has been into the guest house? And you're like, you know what? This is one visit too many. Mike, that Mike Leach. Mike Leach. No, no I, I, I've got a good out on this one. Uh, you know, if they're close friends like Belichick, uh, I put him in the guest house. Uh, if I'm not real sure about him, uh, I meet him at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Feel that a little okay. bit. <laughs> it just depends on who they are. All right, but you're you're telling us that there hasn't been somebody that's overstayed their welcome because of, quarterback. because of how right. wonderful that whole area is where you live, and you just you're on it's sunshine and water every day. Well, R.C. Buford, uh, the general manager of the San Antonio Spurs, uh, he came down uh, with his uh, uh, assistant general manager, and they stayed in the guest house. Oh. and stayed for a couple of days. And oh. we went through the whole talent evaluation, the draft chart, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and, you know with, with basketball only having two or three rounds, the draft chart wasn't going to work. You know, but he wanted to evaluate talent. Uh, and then... He came back a couple of years later. I said, geez, I've told him everything that I know. <laughs> what can I tell him now? Oh, so R.C. Wow. Buford has been We got sad. an answer. But, but we did. Yes. brought in you know, another a new no. assistant general manager because the other one went to Utah. And so I said, I'll meet you at the big field. <laughs> and, uh, ah. So he came in. And he had one of those big easels, you know, uh, you know, where you you kind of have the paper and you turn it over and you turn it over and you turn. He had it all outlined, you know, all the different subjects that he wanted to talk about. <laughs> and I said, geez, R.C., I said, you're worse than Belichick. I said, I ain't got this much time to go through all this. Oh, that is so good. <laughs> so Belichick is still doing it, though, Jimmy, where he'll come and sit at the knee and you guys will commiserate as, as peers because he doesn't have a whole lot of peers, I wouldn't imagine. You know, if somebody asked Bill about it uh, years ago. He said, you know, why is it you always, you know, go back with Jimmy? He said, you know, well, first of all, you know, I studied what he did in Dallas. You know, he said, I studied what he did with the Dolphins. I studied what he did at University of Miami. 
And he said, how many people can I go to that are unbiased? You know, they don't have a dog in the fight. And, and so they're going to be, you know, really honest with me. Uh, that's won a couple of Super Bowls that's had that kind of success in college. You know, you know there's not that many people out there that I really trust that uh, have been through what I've been through. From your vantage point, what do you think happened at the end with Belichick and Brady? Oh, I don't know that anything really happened. You know, um, I, you know, I, I think you know when you're when you've had success like they've had for so long. Uh, there's other challenges out there, and I think there was another challenge out there for uh, Tom Brady. Um, and then toward you know the other thing is you know Tom Brady was getting toward the end of his career. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it was just a, a don't you say that, Jimmy. Careful, Jimmy, don't you Jimmy, say that, I care Jimmy. about don't you. Don't you start I mean, saying Tom Brady's getting to the end of his career. You know, nothing. You Dan said it 10 years ago. You, he put together you, another Hall of Fame career, career wrong, Jimmy. I've been hey. wrong for seven hey. years. Well, you know, Bill <laughs> Walsh said this, and, and of course, this is a hard one to gauge because <laughs> Bill Walsh said, you want to get rid of your superstars a year before they finished. Right. Yeah. Who can gauge whether or not they've got one year left, two years left, or three years left? Uh, but uh, he said that many, many years ago when he was so successful with the 49ers. I'd like to go through some football things here. And Amin, uh, a former for front office executive, wants to uh, pick your brain like all these buzzards like Buford <laughs> and everyone else who want a little more information from the master. I just want to ask how Aikman looks so great with his shirt off, yeah, Jimmy. It, That's it, 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 to be Jimmy, honest with you. Yeah. I told Troy, you know, he comes yeah. down every year. And, of course, we go out on the boat, and he wants to go to the sandbar. He's a single guy. You right. know. Of course he and does. He, he takes that shirt off, and poor, poor old Nick and I are standing there with our guts hanging out. <laughs> and he's got, a, he's got his six-pack, but he works out like a madman. I said, Troy, you're working out more now than when you play. Michael Irvin's the same way. Michael's all bulked up. You know. I said, you know, all these guys, you know, I said, please, it's great. Even Dan. I saw Marino at the Hall of Fame. And he said he had both knees replaced. I oh. said, geez, I wish you'd replace those knees while you were still playing for me. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. I thought you meant Levitar. Yeah, I, I, mean, yeah. I thought you meant that, too. Up. I was going to be flattered that, Did he get steroids cut for <laughs> that he thought I had bulked up the way Irvin and Aikman have. Uh, the, the thing that I wanted to cover with you family-wise, Jimmy, because it seems to me that once you left football, and I'm doing this from the outside, but as I watched Terry Bradshaw decide to show everybody the innards of his life, with performance in a documentary, touring, uh, touring the globe, talking about, you know, being depressed and uh, being late in life and still being out there performing because he still needs it. Whatever it is that the champion entertainer when he was 20 needs it, still trying to fill a hole. It seems like he's your best friend. It seems like he's the family you chose from among these guys. It seems like Sundays are as close to football as you need to be because you get to spend the weekend with Terry. Yeah, yeah, Terry and I, you know, of course, we go way back. I, I watched him play when he was a senior in high school in Woodlawn High School. And, uh, you know, then, of course, we had a, a long period of time when he, you know, was playing with the Steelers and I was coaching. And, and then once we started with Fox, and it's, geez, I mean, it's been like 28 years ago, you know, Terry and I and Pat Summerall and John Madden, they, we were the first four that they hired there, you know, David Hill and Ed Gorn. Then we brought in Howie. Uh, it's been a long time, but, you know, Terry and I, you know, we, we became close when we started watching college football every Saturday before we did the show on Sunday. And like I said, we've been doing it for about 28 years, other than the, the few years that I took off to go with the Dolphins. Uh, but um, just, a, he's just a great guy. He's generous. Uh, he, he's just really a good person. Now, um, once, uh, if it's just me and him, it's one kind of relationship. As soon as that third person comes aboard, then he's on entertainment time. You know, he's going to entertain them. Oh, you get a more uh, honest version of Terry, right? Terry. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, Terry and I have some, some great conversations and of course, uh, along with Nick, Chris, and, uh, uh, they've been close, close friends for a long time. As one of the originators, Jimmy, of Fox television money and seeing the explosion, I want your honest reaction when you heard Tom Brady was going to get $375 million <laughs> to broadcast games. Uh, well, that, that did cause a stir. <laughs> but but I think uh, that is a lot not only uh, for 
you know, uh, being a color analyst or whatever, uh, but it's also for Fox Network total. Uh, and so there's other other stuff involved. And again, I'm not privy to the contract or anything else, but I think it's more than just being part of the telecast. But cause to stir, what does that mean? And I ask, I ask you as a guy, <laughs> as a guy who knows money, a guy who's not afraid to be honest, a guy who's not going to get in trouble with anybody, but you're literally the people who brought football to Fox. Like you guys legitimized and you've been doing it for a long time. And now this guy comes in and trumps everybody's salary. Even Jimmy, I know you made a lot of money and I know that there's not much in the <laughs> ego game that you need right now, but I also know people notice at a company when someone comes in at that salary level well here's what i said in fact you know that, that comment was made in in our little group and, and i said you know guys you got to look at this you know first of all are you happy with what you're making you know if you're happy with what you're making why should you worry about what somebody else makes and and you know we all are well taken care of and uh we all are very happy with what we're doing uh and so you know, why be jealous of someone else if they happen to, you know, do more? I mean, oh, oh, but Jimmy, so the, it, it really wasn't. Jimmy, 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 there's real life wisdom in that. OK, <laughs> but your locker rooms, you were always patrolling locker rooms that were filled with that. You had to manage that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's it's nice that you got the hammer at the top and that way you could control it. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, do you guys all have a group chat like you and Terry and Howie? You guys like all texting each other? In a group. Yeah. Oh, please. It wears me out because I like to go to bed early and, you know, I always have my phone, you know, next, you know, next to the bed and I hear this bing, bing, bing <laughs> all night long. You know, I said, geez, would you guys quit that group texting? I'd pay and money it, to you know, see wears it. wears me out. I have to take my phone and put it in another room. Uh, but, but we do that on a weekly basis uh, about every subject in the world. And in fact, a few subjects that uh, I hope they can't pull this stuff <laughs> off my phone. Oh, I want to see those, Jimmy. <laughs> those are the secret tapes we want, Jimmy. That would be so good. I'll meet you at the big chill, Jimmy. I, Show I, me we, all of them. We I mean. wouldn't, we wouldn't, it wouldn't be a Gruden situation, but we'd get such good, honest stuff that those guys aren't usually saying on air. Do you know how to put uh, the phone on vibrate? Yeah, it, 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 but we have a good time with it. it, it obviously, busting each other's chops, you know. But we put the whole group on there, and then... Occasionally, I tell them, I say, take me off of that particular group text. I, I'll, I'll talk to you guys later. If you open <laughs> but we, up. But, you know, that I think that's one great, great thing about Fox NFL Sunday. We all really do like each other. <laughs> we, you know, we spend time together. You know, uh, you know, Terry comes here to the Keys. Uh, Kurt Menifee, you know, he comes down. I mean, the whole group, you know, we enjoy one another. Except Riggle. I mean. <laughs> Well, Riggle was there Dibble. for a while. I mean, you know, I yeah. love Rob Riggle, but uh, yeah, he you know he does so many things. He got so many movies and all. No, nah, he's not. He's welcome. a big chill guy. Jimmy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a big chill guy. Yeah. Tell us the truth, uh, Jimmy. Is Riggle? A, you know what? Before the end of this segment, I want you guys to get me a list of names that we're going to throw in front yes. of Jimmy, and we're going to ask him: Is this a guest house or is this a big chill guy? <laughs> I love that idea. We're, we're going to play. We'll this start with Levitard. Okay. You guys, you guys are going to get me in trouble. Uh, yes, uh, just a little bit, because I've got some questions that could get you in trouble, including one about Jerry Jones. But I know everyone's asking you about that stuff. And I'd really like to I'd prefer to talk to you about your life because it's an epic one. You're chronicling it now in a book. You're showing people more than you usually do. And I'm here to tell them. And I've told you this before, Jimmy, that. The first 40 years of Jimmy Johnson are vastly, vastly different than the last 40 years of Jimmy Johnson. I don't intend to make you older than you are, Jimmy, but you figured out how to be a grown up when like I don't have it wrong. Right. Your mom. You, died. You're exactly right. And, and you're not the only one that says it, Dan. You know, you know, Terry Bradshaw said, you know, he said I was a SOB back when I was coaching. Troy Aikman says he, he, he said. Jimmy's a different guy now. He's actually likable. <laughs> so yeah, I, I you know I had a job to do. You know I, I yeah I had to you know be the guy that's going to lead the group, and they came from all walks of life. You know you know guys that you know you know came from the streets that didn't have any parenting. You know didn't have any role models. Didn't have any structure in their life. Uh, 
you know, I, I had to be the guy in charge of that. And, you know, if you relax at all, you know, a lot of them are going to fall off the rails. And so that's why I never could relax. I want to ask you about some of the things happening in football now, your assessment of Tua and what the Dolphins are doing. Uh, what did you make of the Tyreek Hill trade? Ooh, uh, he's an exciting player. I talked to Chris Greer uh, just a few days ago, and uh, I told him, I said, man, you brought in some talent, and uh, it's going to be exciting. And, you know, I think the good thing about you know Tua, I mean, of course, with Waddle and you know, with the you know, Gasecki and, and and you look at the Tyreek Hill, man, they, they've got some weapons there, and and the running backs on top of it. I think I think Tua, you know, he's got a good touch on the football as long as they protect him. Uh, it's going to be exciting to see that bunch play. You say as long as they protect him, Jimmy. You know football vastly, vastly more than I do. I can't make an assessment on Tua because when the advanced metrics say that that's the worst pass protection that they have ever seen by an offensive line unit since they started recording these things. That he had less pressure, or he had more pressure than any quarterback in the worst pass protection than any quarterback. Can you evaluate a quarterback that way? Well, I I, I think you. Uh... You have to put some of it on the quarterback in the scheme. Uh, the one thing McDaniel is going to do is bring in the running game, which will help that protection. Uh, I remember when I had Steve Walsh and Craig Erickson, and I, I, you know, even though Steve Walsh went undefeated and won a national championship for me, you know, Craig was you know looking so good in practice uh, that I said, hey, I'm going to toss this thing up. I'm going to make it even and see the two of them out there in practice. And of course, Craig got a lot better, but in his early days, he was holding the ball too long. So a lot of it has to do with the quarterback as much as it does the offensive line and the scheme. And that's where I think McDaniel is going to help. What is your assessment? You feel like you can make one? Can you tell me? Yes. Yeah, I mean, from what I've seen, you know, Tua's got talent. Um, and you just got to make sure that uh, you keep him in check and you have the right kind of scheme to keep him protected. Last time you were on with us, you told the story. I asked you uh, one that got away or tell us a secret story. And you said uh, you had a chance at Peyton Manning. Yeah, you know, I, but I think that they probably made that call to half a dozen teams in the league. <laughs> and, and, you know, obviously there was, you know, I was going to look at it. And, yeah, you know, a, a good young quarterback to develop, you know, behind Dan Marino and, uh, but, you know, there's no way that, you know, we had enough uh, firepower with draft picks to move up to get that pick. So there are no details there that are missing. There are no, uh, uh -huh. like, uh, it wasn't it wasn't something that was close to happening for real. No, it was never close to happening. Is your greatest mistake uh, in the draft passing on Randy Moss? Oh, I, I never had an opportunity for Randy Moss. We actually had traded our picks the day before. And so we never came to that pick. Uh, Randy Moss was taken after our pick. But you could have had Randy Moss in that draft, correct? Well, we could have had Randy Moss had we not traded our picks the right. day before. And we, so actually Randy Moss was picked before our pick uh, came about. And we, we never had the opportunity to, to take Randy Moss because of the trade we made. What do you regard as the greatest uh, personnel mistake you made? Like, do you look back on it that way, or do you just skip past it? Dan, I, I, I must be different from you because I don't ever look at the mistakes. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever made a mistake. <laughs> he looks at the rings, Dan. I mean. <laughs> yeah, but that, that, do you recall all the Hall of Fames that I'm in? <laughs> Congratulations, by the way. Big weekend coming up. I mean. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Uh, people are asking about some of Jerry Jones's comments recently. I'm going to read them to the audience. It's not... <laughs> It's it, it's not to incite you, but because I thought once upon a time that you guys would or could be friends like that and that ego broke you apart and that perhaps something there could have been, um, you know, lasted a lot longer than that and won even more than you guys did if you guys could just figure out how to get along. And it seems like he's harboring sort of a pettiness now. I don't think I have this wrong, but he's still in the game. He's fighting and he's never been able to win as much as he won with Jimmy Johnson. And then, you know, he was going to prove that he could win with anybody. And he did by getting a guy who was a clown and Barry Switzer love Barry Switzer's personality. But for one year, used up all of Jimmy's players and hasn't been back to relevant since. And they, this relationship goes back a long way. 
I side with Jimmy. I don't know what happened there. I do know that Jerry's still chasing somebody, something rather. And so he hasn't put him in the ring of honor yet, even though he says he's going to put him in the ring of honor. And the quotes are, it's BS for anybody to me making anything of that, that he's not in already. I've said I'm going to put him in. Now, when I put him in, in the circumstances and what I do with that, there's a lot more than Jimmy to think about here. And I've got a lot of other lives out here that have laid a lot on the line on that field that need to be in that ring of honor as well. And so how do I do that? Why? What I do with it, I get to make that decision. And it isn't at the end of the day all tailored around whether Jimmy is sniveling or not. It's <laughs> <laughs> such a boss. I, I had to look that word up in the dictionary. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever sniveled. <laughs> Do you ever remember me sniveling? <laughs> well, uh, no, it is not a word I would ever associate with you. And also, like, I, you'd like to be in the Ring of Honor, but as I said, Jimmy kind of likes it in the key, so it'd be a pain in the ass to get on a plane and go there, but it would be emotional like the Hall of Fame was because he doesn't actually need your accolades. But it does seem like he could put down the pettiness here and put your name in the Ring of Honor. Do you think he will do that before you've passed away? Well, that's what I said on the show. <laughs> he said he was going to do it because he told me half a dozen times he put me in. That's what I said while I'm alive. <laughs> you never can tell. That's his decision. <laughs> but he doesn't want to give it to you at the end, Jimmy, is the thing. Of course, it's not that you care. You worry about him and, passing and away it's, first. It's though, not right? that, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Last, I mean, you went there. No, right? Jimmy, the, the last, only thing is if he does it, it's going to be Stephen Jones. <laughs> Uh, Jimmy, the last time he was on with us, mentioned, is he going to put me in? But Like he was joking, but he wasn't because Jimmy's moved past this. I don't think I'm speaking for you here, Jimmy, right? You're you're more bemused by it than anything. Oh, uh, you know, uh, let's see. I think I'm in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Is that the ultimate? You yeah. Know? <laughs> so yep. so I, hey, I'm happy where I am. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have any deep feelings like, oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. <laughs> what what regrets do you have from how all of that ended? Because you it it was possible, Jimmy, for you to never end up back with the Miami Dolphins to ride that out. It, it What oh, would have happened yeah, if you yeah. had stayed in the relationship? Yeah, you know, Dan, and, and I think this is the, the the good part about the book Swagger. Uh, I, I'm in the best relationship that I've ever had with my family right now. My, my sons are super successful, super happy. Uh, I've got a great marriage now. Yeah, I, I used to say, you know, the most fun time I ever had in my life was the five years, at, at least the last four years at University of Miami. Uh, I mean, it was a great Great time. Of course, we were independent. We had a schedule such that we were playing the top teams in the country every other week, and we were kicking their rear end. I mean, it was a ball. Uh, but, you know, I've changed it. You know, the most fun time in my life wasn't you know, those years at University of Miami. The most fun time in my life is right now. There's real learning in that. Like, Jimmy, you've done profound life living awesome. wisdom stuff there because you found your way to happy. Even if uh, like I've seen you, you 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 make a throw up sound when you think of the man you were or had to be the asshole you had to be to, <laughs> to, to run. Well, I mean, you know, Bill Belichick in one of the years he came down after his first Super Bowl. And and he said, Jimmy, he says, you know, what's the biggest thing, you know, that I've got to overcome after this first one? And I said, well, obviously complacency, you know, you know, everybody, you know, you know, they, they're not going to work as hard, you know? And I said, you're the only guy that's got a hammer. Yeah. I said, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. Joe Brodsky, who I love to death, he was my running back coach and, you know, he's no longer with us. Uh, but he did a great job with those running backs. Well, after our first Super Bowl, you know, Emmett Smith held out the first couple of weeks because that's what happens. Everybody in the organization, the secretary wants a new a raise, you know, the video guy wants a raise, the, all the players want new contracts, all the coaches want, want to do this, people were writing books, TV shows, on and on. Anyway, but Emmett held out for a couple of weeks. Well, Emmett comes back in, and then Joe, he was just wearing the rookie, Derek Lassick, out, the other running back. But he, Emmett was always standing over to the side, not getting any work. And I said, Joe... I said, hey, you know, Lassick's fine. I said, but get Emmett in there. Get him ready to play. And Joe looked over and said, oh, coach, you know, he's a veteran. 
he'll be fine on Sunday. You know, and I said, fine on Sunday, my rear end, you know. I said, get him in there, get him ready to play. And that's what happens. Even the the assistant coaches get get soft on those players. They get become friends that, you know, they don't drive them as hard. And I told Bill, I said, you're the only guy that's got the hammer. The hammer on the players, the hammer on the coaches. You've got to demand that they get better because everybody's going to have a target on your back. Everybody's going to be after you. They're going to be better prepared for you this year than they were last year. You know, and so you've got to be better than what you were a year ago if you're going to win it again. Coach, you mentioned how many people come up to you, come out to the Keys to seek your guidance and talk about the talent evaluation process. How much has it changed since when you were in the NFL and and in college? How much of a what? How much has the talent evaluation process changed, you know, with all this extra information? I, I I don't think the talent evaluation changes at all. Uh, I mean, you look at it, you know, just like Buford, R.C. says, well, um, yeah, I understand the talent on players. You know, what about the talent as a coach? He said, you know, Pop's going to retire one of these days. And uh, he said, you know, would you be concerned about a college coach, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera? I said, listen, give me somebody that's really smart and intelligent somebody that's very passionate about what they do and they're willing to work night and day to get the job done. I don't know. I don't care how much they know. Give me those three things and and you'll be fine. But the talent evaluation for players, Hey, you know, give me, you know, intelligence. Yeah. Because I always wanted smart players. They smart players get better, 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 you know, and, and they don't give you the, the, trouble off the field, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I want, you know, I want a gym rat. I want a guy that's going to work night and day. You know, he's going to be part of it. I want somebody that that's a playmaker. You know, he makes plays, not just touching the ball, but he makes key plays. You know, you know, I want somebody with character, you know, and then the other thing I wanted somebody with some speed and quickness. I mean, the talent evaluation is always the same. First one in last one out, that type thing. That's the gym rat. Yeah. 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 Nose to the grindstone. Yeah. 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 If he's late to work and he leaves early, I don't want it. (laughs) Jimmy, what do you say to a Dolphins fan that is okay with Steven Ross going after Tom Brady? Even like, and, and this is around the league. There's a lot of like little conversations happening, tampering here and there. I'm a Dolphins fan. And I was like, hey, Steven Ross is going for it. I wasn't that angry with him. Well... There's one thing to, to be passionate and want to get better, but you also have rules. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, yeah. I, I made the mistake. My my very first job when I went to the Dallas Cowboys, I didn't know anything about tampering. I, I called uh, Dom boy. Capers, uh, who I knew, and I you know, talked to him about being on my defensive staff. Well, right. he was under contract with the Orleans Saints. Worked out. And so I got turned into the league <laughs> for tampering. I didn't know the rules, you know, you know, you can be passionate and you work hard and try to improve, but you got to follow the rules. But if you're not cheating, you're not trying, right, coach? I, I don't believe in cheating. <laughs> and, right. uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I do. Hey, 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 no, no. All right. You know, I, uh, tell me the rules. Yeah, you know, I'll abide by the rules. What about bending and, a rule? You know, hey, yeah. it, let's do it the right way. I, <laughs> you know. I mean, I, back in the days of buying players and crap like that, I, I don't, I don't believe in that. Uh, but that, that happened. Uh, so anyway, no, what, what happened? Hold on, what happened? Somebody else was buying players. What happened? Well, it, 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 let's just say I've taken <laughs> over some programs where they bought players. All right, um, uh, Chris, you wanted to get in here, Billy. You I hit my to... knee again. Okay, so you, it's not because you wanted to get in here; it's just that your face is red, Coach. I'm wondering how many minutes after oh we're done, God. what happened there, Coach? How many minutes after we're done, will you be shirtless on a boat? How many minutes? Well, you never can yes, tell. Oh, Jimmy. He's getting yeah. keeping it from the boat. Oh We're going to keep it from the, the great boat. toe. No, I mean, so he's going to leave. I'll take his nice shirt off here in a few minutes. Let's go. Do it now. Jimmy, do it now. Do it now, now Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy we got a great game Jimmy, coming up. We're going to yes. let you go on this note, but I'd like the punctuation as an entertainer for three decades who, who got Tom Brady that contract because you've got now the right relationship <laughs> with football. You made a ton of money. You found family inside. 
side of football. Aikman's at your house. We're now going to go through the list of people in your world. Do they get the guest house or do they get a nice <laughs> lunch? <laughs> a nice no, I'm guest. not going to play no, this no, game. Jimmy, come on, Jimmy, come on. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. Gonna, it's going to be a We won't get, get you in trouble. trouble because yeah. Dave Hyde put it in an article one time that that uh, Mike Tenenbaum, you know, he went to the – he went to the big chill, yeah. You know, uh, he, he didn't get the guest house. Uh, no, he, and he shouldn't get the call. No, listen, yeah. he's a former realtor. He messed up the Dolphins. He's got to get the big chill. I'll fill in the blanks. <laughs> we're just going to make you a little uncomfortable here. So this is the game we're playing. No, the, I, the longs, I don't play that game. the longs, <laughs> all of the longs. You can't just take Howie because I know Howie's getting the guest the house. The whole family, the whole family, all of the longs. Or do the kids have to go out to the big chill? No, no, actually, you know, the, you know, Chris and Kyle, you know, please, they, they grew up with me. Uh, they, they were little kids when I started with Fox. Uh, in fact, I, I visited with Chris many a time, you know, when he was uh, thinking about going, you know, not playing his senior year, going in the draft, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing about Kyle. So. Uh, they're almost like family to me. Okay, so they get the guest, guest house. house yeah. uh, stra stra <laughs> straight See, in. I, I could cop out and just say everybody. No, but you're not going to do that. You won't do it. You won't do it. You don't like cheating. No, no, you don't like cheating. No, 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 cheating you don't like game, cheating. You're honorable. Yeah. So <laughs> Michael Strahan. Michael Strahan. Uh, yeah, he Strahan. Got now let me tell you what. Michael Strahan and and I didn't know him that well. Other, than, I mean, I should have drafted him. I was going to draft him ahead of his one of my twenty visits. Uh, I brought him up right before the draft and I had a scout in his home because I was going to take him in the third round. He is one of the nicest individuals you ever want to meet. Mm. I mean, he is so nice and such a good person. I was in his home uh, for Thanksgiving with his family. Uh, I mean, he, he, he is a, he's a good guy. So he gets into the guest house. Oh, without question. See, this is easy. You were afraid of this game. You're not afraid no, no, of no, the game. You're going to throw me okay. a ringer here. Okay. A uh, no, well, you don't know that. You don't know what I'm going to throw you. But oh, I know you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to trap you for 30 years, Jimmy. 40 years. You've always been outside my grip. This is the time I'm going to get you. As soon as you say a tough one, I'll, I'm going to press the button. No, Goodbye. no. What, what's, as soon as I say a tough one, here's the deal, Jimmy. Okay. This is the deal I want to make with you because I know you want to get out to the boat. And I very much much i'm appreciative of your time and over the years i'm hugely appreciative of the man you've grown into and how much of your life you shared with me as a dumbass reporter in this market who was real interested in following you around and you taught me a great many things so the end of this it, well if, if if i taught you a few things you better get the book swagger because you'll learn a lot there more. There you go. Yes. So I wanted to publicize the book for you. And if I say an uncomfortable one, I would like you to just take your shirt off and walk out of the room. <laughs> and, and you don't have to turn the zoom off because I know you're going to the boat as soon as we're done here. But I, you might get a couple of more softballs for you before I ask a difficult one. Kirk Menefee. Ooh. Kurt's been in my guest house. Yeah, Kevin and White Violet. See, so easy, the one easy. that I asked you. Yep. <laughs> Joe Buck wants to come down. Joe Buck's been in my guest house. Oh, oh, see, Joe Buck's All right. in right. see, easy ones. No problem. Joe Buck, he can, can buy, buy your house, house now, yeah. Jimmy. Yeah, <laughs> Two of them. You're I mean. noticing these contracts, Jimmy. These are big. Aikman just got a lot of money. <laughs> What do we got? Yeah, next, next one, next Dana. Game. Pregnant pause there. Yeah. Jimmy Kimmel. Mm. You know, I did a, a commercial with Jimmy Kimmel, and he used to be our, our comedian on the show, and how he threatened to Sounds like whip him one day. Um, but uh, yeah, he could guess that's a good guy. Yeah. Oh, okay. That was on the line there. But wait, how Star Howie Power, Dan, Star to quit? Power. Well, I, I said he threatened to whip him one morning in a production meeting because I guess one of his little skits made fun of Howie. Oh, my God. He would have destroyed. He would have dragged. <laughs> oh, him. it would have been ugly. How about let's go through all the comedians. Frank Caliendo. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. Frank's a good guy. I like him. Riggle. Yeah. Yeah. Riggle. OK. Good guy. All the comedians are welcome. Big chill. Well, no, not big chill. It They're sounds well, like no, Caliendo no, was no, a big he, chill no, guy. No, I mean, it's all guest house material. Okay. Uh, right. See, see what you're doing is people that are that I know that are friends. That's easy. 
But if they're a stranger mm. and I don't know them, then you're, you're talking about a possible big chill guy. Right. Jerry Jones would like to use the guest oh. house. <laughs> Please, he can, he, he can buy the guest house. Yep. <laughs> but he wants to use it. He Jimmy. wants to hey, use no, it. He can, he'll put his 250 foot yacht right out in front of the house. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a big chill guy. Not no. even. You wouldn't even go to the big chill with Jerry right now. Yard house. Oh, no, Jerry, when Jerry and I are together, hey, we're the best of friends. But it it was kind of like the chapter on Jerry, it says, you know, when he tell me how much he appreciated what I did at, uh, you know, with Dallas, he said, I know how to, he said, you know, I love you. I said, yeah, I love you too. He said, I said, you know, sometimes I hate you. He said, sometimes I hate you too. <laughs> so we got a great relationship. I, I just don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great man. I mean, <laughs> See you later. Wait, uh, now there's, there's one more you have to ask. Okay. Joe Zagaki. What? That's the one I had to ask. That's the one we're all Zagaki. dying to know. Okay, yeah, Josie. Yeah. For sure, he'd be guest. Why? Well, thank you. Yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jackie, man. I, I remember I called him one night with Jackie and Sonny Hurst uh, back. Oh, I'm honored. Thirty-five years ago or something. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, good catching up with you, Jimmy. Always good seeing your face. And as I tell you every time, it's really nice to see you so happy. Okay, I enjoyed it, guys. All right, congrats on and the Hall girls. of Fame. Yep. <laughs> Good to see your fun, too. I love what just happened with Stu Gatz during that Jimmy Johnson interview. What happened? It is so rare where we can feed Stu Gatz stuff, and yep. he is terrified to say yeah. it. I He's am. never wow. afraid of Dan. Yes. He'll go with any joke. There were probably five or six lines fed to Stu Gatz there to like make a little joke at Jimmy's expense, and he just gave us a look. Was like I'm terrified. I, I won't do it. I am terrified of Jimmy Johnson. I call it the most like when I call Jimmy, it's the most dangerous call in the history of sports radio. You have one minute to make your pitch, and I just scream "Lebitard" into the phone and hope that he <laughs> says yes. And usually he hangs up on me, and so I'm terrified of the guy. I don't know what to tell you. Like I'm scarred. Why are you so afraid of Jimmy? Because he's Johnson? yelled at me before. Weird. Yeah, I mean but, he but, has. But I do believe that Jessica, whose only experience with Jimmy Johnson, you're scared of the mythology and also that he can see a crook from a mile away. Jessica, oh. Jessica is Thank looking you. at a nice old man who's on with us. Why would you be afraid of him? Correct. That's a nice old man who's been on your he television. Seems lovely. Yeah. He showed us his foot. All right, you try and <laughs> you try Christ. to call him and book him next time and see how it goes. Yeah, but we like got he, past I feel that. like he would love me. He loved my question about the group text. Yeah. He did. He really did. <laughs> he, that was the best question of the whole thing. He was delighted. Roy tried to get in with, uh, don't you know how to put your phone on vibrate? Yeah. Which just... I'm guessing is the jokes that Stugatz was getting. What were the ones he was afraid of? What were the good All openings? of them. Yeah. Get, let's yeah. hear the jokes. But let's hear whether or not he should have delivered them or not. Do you guys not remember let's... any of them? Because you guys don't get vetoed very often by Stugatz. In fact, so, uh, there's a lot of times... I don't know if it's about 10% now, where Stugat says it without realizing what he said. Oh, 100%. <laughs> just, yes. He's not, he just. I would put it, it at 20%. Hey, yeah. Is it that high? Okay. Yeah, yes. You guys don't remember any of it, though. You've been doing it no, so long that you're we bored. We had to go, we went with some of them ourselves because, like, what? It, like, it was yeah. weird. Like, you had the yips all of a yeah. sudden. You just didn't want to ask questions. I threw it right odd. back to you. Yeah. Listen, he we did the thing where he points, like, you yes. should do that. You yeah. should yeah. ask yeah. That. that. That's a great question. You ask it. <laughs> <laughs> I want nothing to do with Jimmy. I, I love him. I'm happy he's headed to the Hall of Fame in Canton this weekend, but I want nothing to do with Jimmy Johnson in terms of just pissing him off. He because like someone that likes to be messed with a little bit. No, like but so, because there's so many people around him that are just afraid that listen, if someone pulls his leg, like I think Jimmy likes a good practical joke at his expense. Guys, the only one, the only person who's been yelled at by Jimmy Johnson in this entire scenario is me. No, it is not. You have? Oh, my God. <laughs> that, really? You're not scared then? Are you shitting me? Not to He's get, yelled at you? Not, he woke me up. Freshman in, year. In my <laughs> No, 7.30 in the morning to scream at me for a column I've written. Uh, what was the column? It was, he was, he was uh, a mercenary who was just grabbing a bunch of immoral guys and putting them in his huddle. And what was, I was that, like, by the way? He doesn't like cheating. Oh, that was, I loved it. I loved it. I was like, attaboy, to the grave. <laughs> Just keep saying the, <laughs> saying the same line. I'm Jimmy right. Johnson on behalf of Stubborn Defiance. <laughs> but he has learned a ton. And um, 
I'm not scared of him anymore, but this person is not to be scared of, Stugatz. This is a, it's a different human being. Like, well, you're you're afraid of the mythology of the man. And and look, Dan, he's got, I'm scared. No, he's he's, got, got, he's got, yelled at he's me got, many look, times. He's got no time for fools and assholes. So, Damn, no, right. and, I, and I don't even, I'm not even <laughs> Sorry, delivering Stugatz. that your way. No. <laughs> well, it feels like you are. No, I don't I mean, mean it that way. Right. I'm saying that Jimmy Johnson, what he does not tolerate, I, I'm, I, I swear, Stugatz, you don't have to have a, it's def okay. a defense mechanism <laughs> it, it, that. It's makes okay. you think I'm calling you a fool and an asshole. Well, you did, but it's okay. One it's, out of two ain't bad, Stugatz. Yeah, I guess it's all thing. Stugatz is afraid of making the joke that makes Jimmy think he's a fool or an asshole. Like I'm that. afraid of making the joke that's going to have Jimmy Johnson yell at me. I mean, that's that's really what I'm afraid. I'm just afraid of Jimmy. I can't explain it. Is there like, anyone else on that list no. on, in sports? No. There's nobody no. else that you no. feel like that. Just Jimmy. That's it. The guys know it. Like That's why Chris was so shocked, because usually I'll just go with it, but... Not with Jimmy. I don't know what it is. Well, you grew up in this market as a child, and he was fearsome, intimidating coach who like taught you how to uh, how to talk. I feel like he's going to make me run sprints. I mean, I don't know what a <laughs> what <laughs> for what. <laughs> What was that question that drew that answer? That was a means that question. That was a question. horrible question, by <laughs> okay, me. Okay, terrible. Let, let, let's it, you know what it was? It wasn't, it, was a hor it wasn't a horrible question, but my delivery was horrible because I realized. There was a vibe scared. to the interview. You got scared. I got it was upbeat, it was, yes. I, like, as we're talking it out, <laughs> you got scared osmosis. Because, you got scared because. What? <laughs> you felt my fear. We were having yes. fun. It yeah. was lighthearted. Yeah. And you're like, coach. <laughs> Has it changed the way you draft players now say, or something like I that? Say, All I of a sudden it got football y and serious. Well, Dan and asked a football terrified. question. So it opened the door to football questions. So I, then I like I piggybacked <laughs> on that with another football question. The problem was I should have asked it. You guys are right. I, my vibe should have been fun. And I, there's a way I can ask that question. It was like, I'm a coach. There's just so much more stuff, you know, like that. Instead, I lowered my voice an octave. You did. You went into like the guy who does previews for movies. I absolutely went coach. <laughs> and, and and I really, you know, the, now, now here's the funny thing. Stugatz, you know who the version of this Rated for me R. is in basketball? Who? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Really? What? I, I did. I just, did. Just let's yeah, stop for a second. Hard. Yes. Just let's stop for a second because... In the middle of what was an otherwise lovely conversation with Jimmy Johnson, Amin, soaked in the fear that he got through osmosis, osmosis from Stugatz. <laughs> what? <laughs> He arrived and and took a shit in the middle of the interview. Who's this guy talking? Oh, look, it's the guy who's all reverent because R.C. Buford is somebody I kicked out of my guest house. So, I mean, he's like respecting leadership. And then he's like, well, Dan and Stugatz really seem to respect this guy. And Jessica's like, who's this nice old man? The crazy part, the crazy part Dan, is it wasn't even a conscious decision. It's just, you know, like pack animals, like when they sense danger and then they see everyone else sensing danger, they just behave the same way. <laughs> right. that's, that's what I did. Uh, and so you did this to Jimmy Johnson. But what? <laughs> we will forgive you. Uh, do we know, Billy, you have come in here for two days. You shouldn't be driving. Never mind flying. I, I was on a text string last night in which uh, you were being asked to fly to to Canton and you shouldn't even be driving in here because you showed us that you're, you're peeing through a strainer now in case We're stones come out of home you today. So I got to take the full urine home oh, and strain oh, it if Jesus. I have to. Yeah. Don't worry. I brought my container again. We don't know if Stugatz is going to get to Baselli, but this is embarrassing at this point, right? Because Baselli has been strong armed. He, he is very nice to Stugatz. I, I, I don't know how much time they've actually spent together, but Baselli legitimately. I met him once. Baselli really <laughs> Wait, likes. what? Radio Row. I mean. <laughs> You've only met Baselli once at Radio Row? We have spoken on the phone many times, but I've only met Baselli one time at Super Bowl Radio Row down here, Billy, with you. He came over to the table. That's the only. That He's was the first guy. time and the only time I met Tony Baselli. But the the furthest that you, have, you have to understand how funny this is as art. Stugatz has strong armed his way into friends and family and the parade, and he's met Baselli once. And the party. And the party. Yes. He, he's breaking. He's a little lukewarm on the parade. I have to be honest. He said, "Be there Saturday at eight. I told him I'll be there Saturday at eight. He came back and said, 
I have to see if I can get you in the parade. Well, I was not happy with that. Well, he does. Like you offered it to me, Baselli. Yes. I mean, well, I'm not you, afraid of him. You can't I mean, be. You can't be turned down here. But Billy, are we going? Because I don't trust. I I'm dead serious here. This is not a bit. I did not know that Stugatz was coming in today. I'm delighted to have him here. But I thought he was. You. I thought he was going to Lake Placid, and then he was going to maybe Canton, or maybe not Canton, or maybe a dead show, or maybe right. a lacrosse mitzvah. Dead shows are over, right? Are you going? Going because you've now made all the asks and Billy it can't go with you. The last thing I want to do is hop on another bird, especially to Ohio. But uh, I feel like I should go. Like Baselli has really given me crazy access. Like Dan, I am able to go to the party, broadcast from the party, record. No video, he said. Okay, but I could do audio. I could record interviews. It's the Jacksonville Jaguars party. It's the Hall of Fame party. So I could do that. The parade's still up in the air. I thought I would be in Tony's car, sitting right next to him, perhaps driving the car during the parade, which would be great. He's not going to mention me in the Hall of Fame speech. He has agreed to give me friends and family tickets for me and whoever comes. And feel free to join me, Dan. It'll be a nice weekend. Uh, I'll be sitting right next to the wife and kids. I mean, <laughs> they banned to me. I'm on TV. I mean, like I'm his best friend. <laughs> Billy, are are we going? I look? mean, I, this kind of goes back to what was happening before with Samson, right? Like, I don't know who decides that. Who decides if he's going or not? Because hmm. he wants to go, I think. Do you, <laughs> you want to go? I do want to go, yeah. I, I would like to go. I don't know, man. I had to talk to guys into it. I'm not convinced. <laughs> I, I, can you believe anything Stugat says? I, you no. Know what, you know what I'm wondering here? I, I, and this, mm. Stugat, I love you. Mm. I'm wondering if this is one of those things where you're asking and you kind of want the answer to be no. no. And right. then you're like, you see, I told you. So I can tell Tony, like, hey, the company won't let me go. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Like Mojo's bachelor party. Right. Uh, kind of hoping that's the case. <laughs> Not going to lie. <laughs> Do we know what any of this costs? Who's in charge around here? Who makes these decisions? Can you guys get me somebody from the other room? Who's, the suits. who's corporate around here? There are 70 people in the other room. So <laughs> I, I know we're paying for all of them. Let's and, go to Bob Bob. I, uh, Frankie's Bob, here. You want to talk to Frankie? Anybody. Bob. Just bring me somebody. Every day there's Who's, a new person who's, in there. there are more there's more security now we've had to double up security around like here fort knox in here uh, but I mean. now and now okay this is bob so bob, go to bob bob all right so let's see if this is how we do this as a company okay right. fresh off jury duty so we're asking bob if i can <laughs> go to the hall of fame bob, bob with tony Baselli. bob is the engineer he's held the whole place up here i'm gonna try and take like a company vote or yeah, something exactly here right. bob okay. bob thank you you've held the whole place on your shoulders here for for uh, too long he wants to get out of this business is a dirty business god almighty he wants to get to retirement and a peaceful wants life to get back to buffalo and everybody just complains about metal arc do more do different things you guys suck you used to be good it's all bob's fault that was sagaki uh bob <laughs> should stugatz go should the company pay for stugatz we had plenty of time to plan this six months to plan it last minute we're doing it no just do we need to do it because we're idiots? Because we get surprised by things. Uh, no time to sell it. Nothing. Sugats just has to go and have a paid vacation. Yes or no? Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. My guy, Bobby. All right. So uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, if you want to say anything else, if you have anything else. I, I have I a question it. for a Bob. Connection. Bob, so afterwards, after the Hall of Fame, uh, when in Rome, I'll never be closer to Montana than I will be at the Hall of Fame. There is a John Mayer Bob <laughs> Weir concert in Montana I'd like to go to on Sunday, if possible. Bob, yes or no? Can he come? Uh, no. Well, Bob. Oh. Okay, so the company wow. cannot pay for that. Wow, Bob, it's a awesome. hard ass. Okay, wow. Bob, thank you for being on with us. We appreciate it. Have you ever looked at a map? Yeah, Montana's yeah, not that like close. Ohio's, yeah, a little directy. Ohio's I'm telling you, near, uh, closer to uh, Joe Montana. Montana. I'm telling you right now, a little directy <laughs> from uh, from Cleveland to I believe it's Cleveland to uh, to Bozeman, Montana. Uh, there's a little directy, and I could be there. It's an hour and a half. I All right, mean, uh, Bob, that's good leadership from you. I don't know if we're any terrible. closer to a decision. If you're here. Bob in that spot, you can't be giving out too many yeses. That's good job by him. You yeah. got to be balanced. All right, so who else Bob is in charge weaving. back there? Right. Hilde. Okay, so Bob Hilde. And weaving. All right, and then he so waltzes <laughs> away with my cards. <laughs> All right, so Hildy, oh, uh, among Hildy. her I many stand jobs, a chance. you don't think you hold? Why wouldn't no, you? Hildy, no, Hildy's pro travel. Hildy's pro travel. I've caused her many a headache, Dan. I mean, Hildy, you have. 
Yo, I know I have. Yes. Yeah. With what? Just, I don't know anything about this. I don't know. know. Previous travel. I mean, just stuff like that. Okay. Hildy, uh, I don't know what your honest relationship is. All Stu guys does is complain about everything. She's very so. thorough. She asks a lot of questions. Yeah. That's not the type of person I oh, want yeah. in charge here, Dad. Just don't okay. ask me any questions and say yes. Okay. I mean, so, yes. yes, that's that's part right. of the problem. Hildy's always got a follow up. I mean, Yes. Okay. This is wonderful. So she does her job. Chris Cody did <laughs> well. I tell you, Chris Cody, when you went around the company, That's, you know, no, Stugatz, yeah. when Chris Cody went around the company, yep. and I did not know putting who, that very aggressive. No, Chris. Everyone in the company said you could not go to the Super Bowl. You everyone, have, one person, Billy. either way. You know, was it Bob? <laughs> it was not Billy. <laughs> Billy was the one that delivered the news to him yeah. that that decision was made because I felt like he was not going to hear that news until two days before he boarded a plane. And All I right. said, well, let me give of, my heads none, up. Well, none of this would have happened if Hildy were here. <laughs> not, okay, is the point. And now Hildy is here. So, Hildy, should Stugatz be allowed to go to the Hall of Fame paid for by the company? If I can strap on a GoPro to so wear a Levitar cap, no I'll pay for it with the Ram Tars. Wow. Whoa. But there's no video allowed, Hildy. Well, no, no video at the, the party. party. Just the at party. The party yeah. Yes. Hildy, get closer to the mic. Closer, closer to the mic. Yeah. Send us a postcard. I hope it's great. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Hildy's pro travel, man. I'm I telling mean, you. Okay. Travel. Sorry. Okay. She is pro. Uh, she is pro spending money. Uh, thank you, Hildy. Uh, your, uh, your first voyage I stand corrected. near a microphone yeah. was very far from a microphone. <laughs> mm hmm. Um, and let's see if the uh, are these are suits. Who else? Carl. Is in Carl. <laughs> Carl. It, wow. Director wow. of audio. Executive, right? Executive director editor? of audio. Executive director of All audio. audio in the world. He's the Everything. director of every you hear, If you hear audio. something. In the pecking <laughs> order, is he higher, lower than Bob? Like, um, it's or debatable. chart, uh, right? The, it's uh, Everywhere different branches, Bob. yeah. This okay. company, we're all on the same level. Parallel. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't think that that is true at all. I think that uh, that Carl is in charge of audio. Oh. <laughs> Wait, what? so Chris is not at Carl's level, just so we're clear. Semantics. Well, but Bob's not in charge of audio, but if Bob leaves, then everything falls we'll apart. We'll have no audio. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, that's correct. So Bob should be Carl's boss as right. the engineer. And Bob was a yes. Wow, yeah. yes. Right. This sounds out of whack to me. <laughs> Carl just got demoted. Somehow this well, sounds out of whack. But if, yes, if the sound can't get to people, as it sometimes can't, what yep. good does it do for you to be in charge of audio? Uh, where are we with Stugatz? Can you tell me the practical problems? Are we going to be able to get an hour of content from Stugatz that would make it worth the expense. What is the expense? Just know, Carl, that your boss, Bob, said yes already. Okay? <laughs> I mean, just know that going in. Okay? What is the expense? Do we know how much it would cost to get a team together because Stugatz isn't going to be able to turn on a Zoom? It's a healthy question, I think. A question, yeah. but a couple, couple thousand dollars, probably. Somewhere in there. Okay, I should have asked Hildy. Uh, uh, so it's going to cost... Plus his appearance fee. How many people have to go? And the mayor concert. That's, that's the question, right? Are we, we doing audio? Are we doing video? What, what's the game we're playing here? What is the game we're no playing? No videos allowed. He's told us that oh, a couple Only in the party. Times. Only and in the, the party, acid, though. yeah. Are you going to get what? Peyton Manning? That's the question. You're asking me? I mean, <laughs> what are you going to get in 50 minutes? Why would I get Peyton Manning? I mean... Because you're at the Hall, the Hall of, of Fame. Fame. That's the guest booker's job. I mean, <laughs> have we said anyone? I mean, <laughs> so he's going to put as many costs as he can okay. here so the company has to say no as it votes yes because then he gets the pressure <laughs> of content. I, I, is, would you send Stugatz to Canton? I'm all about the content. If we're getting content, I'm all for it. Send them the content. But Ooh. are we getting content? Yes, he, he here's what I can tell you about the content. Oh, no, the fingers are flying. Yeah. I get oh. audio at the party. I get to do visual at the parade and perhaps the ceremony. You said the parade I don't know how that iffy, works. Though. You yeah, said the parade was up in the air. He's wishy washy. What, for, for, I got to be this Pacelli guy. What, what, he's wishy washy. Yeah. <laughs> what are we getting for the expense? If he's saying it's all about content, so now you're going to have the pressure. You can't go there and just party with Baselli. You've right. got to. Like you've got to make it worth the expense to to the company, correct? Yeah. You listen, I'll tape some interviews. Uh, I don't know with whom. Cliff Branch, perhaps. I mean, how about that? That would be exciting. Well, shouldn't you go and try and get Peyton Manning or no? I mean, I would try to get Peyton Manning. It'd be nice to have a guest booker who would also try to get Peyton Manning. I mean, listen, we went to Tahoe. I don't Chris did a great job, okay? But he would go uh -oh. to the range uh -oh. yes. and he would come back Here's and say point. Alex Caruso is there, but he wouldn't come back with Alex Caruso. Returning I mean, it was so. in the middle of Returning the tournament. I mean, that's a good point. I mean, <laughs> is Carl in charge? 
Who's in charge? Who's making this decision? It's Dugats ultimately making this decision. Well, Bob said yes already. Isn't at some point not everything's about money. If you have yeah. a good time, it's about experience. You ever go on an expensive yes. vacation, Dan? Not when you're running right. a business. You yeah. get back, you get back, and you're like, you know what? I had a great time. I made some right. memories. But the Dan, listen, I can guarantee you this. I will get some audio and interview with Baselli, who's a Hall of Famer. But we perhaps that. Tom Coughlin. And the memories, okay? though. Maybe Jimmy Smith, Keenan McCardell, Mark oh. Brunel. I mean, people like that. That's 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 good content. Do, man. do you think you could get Tony Khan? Because that would be a great get. I think I can get Tony yeah. Khan, too. Yeah. I mean, okay, how about that? Uh, uh, and then, Dan, it's the Hall of Fame, and it's me, and it's a who's who, and who knows who I'm going to get, you who's know? Who? Trey Wingo will be out there. Well, I mean, oh, 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 <laughs> third. Who knows who I'm going to get? Boomer. I mean, can't be what it was at Tahoe, which is the same people we could just call and get. Right. I it's got to be guests that are like I. I want. Should we not be putting pressure on this to produce the content that it costs to to have it? Probably not. I mean. Absolutely. But I want to go, you know, he's, he's my friend. He's invited me. Money. He's given me access. Who doesn't want access to the Jaguars? I also feel like this opens the door for Stugatz to become friends with other Hall of Famers. That's a good You go, point. you yes. party, all of a sudden Love there's a another Hall of opening. Famer there. And the only thing I'm uncomfortable with is I don't know how the Hall of Fame works. Like you're just assuming Peyton Manning's walking around yeah. and he's willing just to sit down this and talk could, to me for we, 15 minutes. We could chalk this one up to a learning trip. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? Like a scouting a trip. Yeah. He's, I'll map it out for out yes. there, kind of. No, but you some... guys have had like five of those no, already. No. I'm still waiting for the <laughs> Masters content that cost Not money. Not a How much did Masters content cost? What did we get uh, out of that? I don't know. Dan, Dan, uh, who he, has the answers to that? Do you guys at that That's tent? No, oh, it's you guys. Me know. and my dad. Exactly. Right. Did yeah. Yeah. Body to the memories. Yeah. Back yeah. to the memories. Yeah, exactly. We, right. Right. Max Homa blew him off. Wait a minute. It Amazing. sounds like I should be talking to Hildy. Hildy, come back in here. Let's right. see if we can get you closer to the microphone. I want to but know. the Masters is a perfect example. Hildy asked too many questions, but <laughs> Dan, that's the perfect example where life, listen, it doesn't always have to be content, okay? Life experiences, an experience with my dad, going to the Hall of Fame for the first time. That's what it's all about. That's what life is all about, Dan. I'd like you to go with me. Well, some people would say, though, that you need to plan these things and then sell these things, and it shouldn't well, be done two hours job. in advance. Uh, well, no, but it ends up like, who's in charge here? See, uh, I, I like the idea of this being a scouting trip because then next year, Stugatz will have enough time to get fitted for a gold jacket. Wow. And right. then you oh, wow. wear the jacket. It, like, it doesn't have the patch on it, but it's just, hey, this is what I decided to wear this what weekend. Speak, Dan, Dan, you know me. You are putting me in a room full of Hall of Famers. Like, that has no, to go well. Also, it has no, to go well. I also know you, and I know that the I'll Masters... I'll go by myself. I don't care. I mean... I know that the Masters didn't produce a room full of Hall of Famers. Well, I, I mean, they were playing I golf. Know, I know I mean. Tahoe <laughs> produced uh, Joe Buck. Like, I... He made news. And Boomer. I mean, yeah. Um, who well, else is back there? Yeah, who there's no way we get Iguodala unless we go all the way to Nick top. Jonas, right. Justin Timberlake, Ray exactly. Romano. Exactly. Tell them, Chris. We got them all. They weren't Everybody. on. Everybody. Yeah. Check back on that episode. They were <laughs> all on. Who was making this decision? Uh, it's your company. Bimmel's here. Yeah. Come on in, Bimmel. Let's do this. Uh, what happened to Frankie? Oh, Frankie. Oh, uh, yeah. And and what happened? And and what happened? Is Hildy the one I should be talking no, to? No, it, oh, well, no. see, Hildy. It well, sounds no. to me like but Hildy said the one. yes. Let me talk Hildy to Hildy again. Well, Let me talk Kristen, to Hildy again. Maybe. I put hey! Kristen. Yes. Oh, Kristen. Yeah, yeah. Right, Kristen. Well, Kristen, Kristen asked a lot of questions. Can Kristen too? say the things that Hildy was unwilling to say because Hildy didn't want to actually betray company confidences? Like when Stugat says, "Don't ask that person questions," it makes me want to ask that person questions. I don't think I'm asking Hildy enough questions. <laughs> Hildy likes to spend money though. Yeah. Like she's all in. She does, she's all yeah. in on this. She stuff. just yeah. like oh, you're yeah, talking absolutely. about. She's like, tell me early enough, and I will get it approved. But she wants that's it. Yeah. That's right. Line. She wants it planned, not two days in advance. Right. Like this is the that's problem. The we knew Baselli was getting into the Hall of Fame for a long time, so now we can't sell it, and then it loses money. And do we get the content? It can't be mm. Tony Khan drunk at a Jags party. There's always sheets and giggles. I mean. Kristen hasn't come across the hall yet, but I think she was just in Chicago, and I don't think she wants people asking questions about that. Eddie Play. I mean, what? I, who's in charge? Like, get me someone at a microphone. <laughs> I think you might be. Get, yeah. get me. So, no, who, I am not in charge. Who, I am who, not in charge of the money. They, who, we got a whole company that's handling the money. So, on the company website, our internal website, it tells you who you report to. 
Right. Right? It's like everyone, you click on your name and it says, this person reports to this person. So, Stugatz, when we click on your name, who does it say you report to? You. Oh, shit. <laughs> there is an org chart around here. Does Kristen know what the org chart is? Who does Stugatz report to? Is that a question for Carl or is that a question for Bimmel? What are we asking Kristen? Kristen, come over here, you, please. You, Thank you. Get close to the microphone. You were asking about the cost of stuff. I well, think it's a question for Bob. No, do you you know whatever Hildy's secrets were that she, she didn't want to betray confidence the there? Stugat yeah. seems to be afraid of Hildy. Can you tell me what's happening here? Can I get an honest appraisal for what's happening here? Why has Stugat's run afoul of Hildy? Honestly, not sure, but we have a budget. I, mean, oh, I can't go over that budget. Okay, here we go. She hits right. you with the company oh, the corporate lingo. Ah, the corporate budget, lingo. Please. That's the first concrete mm -hmm. corporate and lingo. When I gun. travel, Dan, I like to shoot for the stars. So who's it's always, in, you know, it's first class everything. Who's in know? charge of that budget? I mean, I love our travel who's in agency. Who's in charge, Kristen? The executives. All right. Bimmel's right there behind well, really, it. the travel agency. I invented the show 20 years ago, just so we're clear, everybody. <laughs> and what I like about our travel agency is, unlike the executives here, they never say no. They always say yes. First class, upgrades, hotels, wow. hotel room upgrades. The travel we agency is that. always there yeah. for me. Okay, oh. well, we don't have a travel agency. I'll give you a name and a number. Who's in charge of travel and how bad has Stugat's <laughs> expense accounts been? Who's the question I asked that of? You know that Stugat's wants you know, the best of the best. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. travel warriors is our, I deserve it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, Bimmel, somebody else, Frankie, somebody else tell me who it, I just need to know if Stugatz is going to get Frankie there, if we can pay for it. I need to know who's in charge here of the money. Remember who got you here, Bimmel. I mean, I'm just Bimmel, saying. So Bimmel's, Bimmel's our COO. Yeah, Perhaps we should all remember. I Greg mean, Cody's back. Well put. If you have oh, a C at the start, oh, that's a good title. Yeah. He's the one who shaved Greg Cody's back is a hell of an intro. <laughs> <laughs> so Bimmel's in charge. That's what's in charge. All right. Explain some of this to me because I don't know how the money works around here. Who does Stugatz? I spend it. <laughs> <laughs> who does Stugatz report to? Actually, on the org chart, um, Stugatz reports to you. Ooh. Whoa. Oh, okay. Who does Dan report this to? This is like a who done it. Like at the end, like the person asking all the questions, it turns out it was you all along. Yes, what a what a surprise <laughs> to me that on the org chart, Stugatz reports to me. This and is great. I I never say no to Stugatz. So it sounds like Chris followed the rules <laughs> going like yes. to you. <laughs> um but that's not how it needs to work, evidently. <laughs> well, it is how it is. Wait, but I, I mean, report to call shit. Yeah. Okay, so yes. Wait, so Bimmel, who does Dan report to? Dan reports to no one. God. Nobody. Okay. Nobody. No, wow. no, no. Wow. Dan reports to Valerie. That's true. Okay. Yes. All right. That's All true. Right. It's fair. Uh, thank right. you. Call Valerie. Yes, Valerie. Valerie. Yes. Valerie is standing on a balcony right now, drinking champagne. Call, call Valerie. And looking call evil. Valerie. Let's see if uh, she's going to say no. Uh, why would she say no? She, everybody here wants you to have fun. Everybody here wants you to go get good content for the company. It's just we'd like to pay for it. And I'm have just it be hoping good someone says no. I'm not certain I even want to go. I mean, uh, Bimmo. Uh, have the trips that Stugat's been made, that he's made, are they good business ventures? Have they been good business <laughs> good ventures? Oh, business ventures? You should answer that. Granted, my boss. Re remember, some of these are scouting trips. Yeah, they're mainly, right. if it's yeah. R&D and research, I think it's it, it's okay. But right. from as a business, no, not so, not so, not so good. <laughs> not, ROI, not, not so not high? Not so good business. Uh, and, and going into today, I actually thought that there was a bunch of guests lined up. For, right for Ohio, I thought I heard the Banning Brothers. I there heard could Khan. be. Yeah, I heard that you're good friends of Baselli. I heard there was going to be a lot of a lot of interviews lined up. You're going to be in a VIP party. There's going to be video allowed, but it all kind of unraveled here in the last right. few minutes. Where well, there's where, a con not, for they, sure. They, I promise you. They, I mean, <laughs> there is a con. the con is clear. The con is clear. I can get Tony Khan. I can get Baselli. I can get Fred Taylor. I can get all the Jaguars. Tom Coughlin. I'm not certain about the other Hall of Famers. I can't guarantee it. I can guarantee you I'm going to try to get them because who wouldn't want to talk to Peyton Manning, you know? I mean. But you need a guest booker. How much is this going to cost, Bimmel? Do you I mean, know? I'll what? end up doing it. But so. Do you know what? How many? But it, no, if you need a guest booker and camera people and audio people, how many people do we need to send now that it's not just Sugatz's expense account? Because Carl said it's thousands people? of dollars. It sounds like it's much more than thousands of dollars. Bimmel, you give me 20 grand, send me by myself, and I'll make it work. I promise you. Yeah, we're, okay? we're, we're probably looking at that. 
All right. that's we'll make it 50. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you hate just you to be that. safe. You I mean, all yourself. Well, no, just uh, you, Mayor, Weir, Montana, Bozeman, Acid. I mean, just in case. It's a lot know? of travel, but what are you coming back with? That's what we need to know, right? Memories. What are you coming back Memories. with? Memories. Memories, yeah. yeah, I think. <laughs> the acid, the acid okay, kind no, of messes with we, that. We don't need memories. Hopefully not well, the acid. What about guarantees? What about, what about content guarantees? Yeah, because content guarantees. I just guarantee no, them. So God, come on. Tony Khan and Fred Taylor and Buscelli, like, come on. Well, Coughlin. <laughs> I mean, what are the what are the promises? What what can be? What is the audience? It's a bad class. I got to be honest with you. It's a bad Hall of Fame class. Like Cliff Branch is the most famous guy. Man. What's the audience going to get for the company expense of you trying Dick to for meal of you trying to sneak Lake Placid into this trip as well? What's for the hour you farted out yesterday before your internet blew out? That was a good hour. You'll get a bill for that, boss. Bimmo, do you have a vote here? What's prudent? Just tell me what's prudent business-wise. I would like to improve the morale of this company. I would like to improve Stugatz's morale, but he is insatiable, okay? It's impossible to improve it because he's always going to want more. What is the proper thing for us to do by Stugatz, and what is the proper thing for us to do by this business? The proper thing to do as a business is you keep them home. Wow. Yeah. But... <laughs> We are in the Ooh. business of dream making. Yeah. Yeah. Making wow. Happy, making and wow. building morale, Make making memories, memories partying with Coney Khan. <laughs> so I would say. Get him on a plane. Wow. Bob yeah. Weir, John Mayer, here I come. All I right. Mean, well, it sounds like it. the company. Well, hold on. Is, Valerie still hasn't but, told us what to do. But yeah, we still need to hear from Valerie. But I, th I still think we should put in some measurements here. We should put in oh, the no. number of interviews you get back. Right. We will deduct it from the cost. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're oh, going to wow. get Oh, wow. Incentive based. Oh, Incentive based. That's good. Okay. That's good. So where are we setting the number at? Like, and quality. Like, what are we doing here? I would say. Because I can get like five interviews easily. I mean. Yeah, but interviews that you can't get normally on the show. I mean, we've Stugatz. never had Trey on before. Stugatz. Stugatz. Well, hold on now. Now, what they're saying is it'll deduct from the cost. But that means if you do enough interviews, right. at some point, they have to start paying you extra. Okay, if so I go over. If you go, yes. over, go over, you get the I like overages. That. Right. So I think we can play this okay. where we line up enough interviews with just like ushers and, and people who work there. <laughs> people we never yeah. had right. on the show people before was the only rule. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Loopholes, Billy, really, are you willing it. to produce this, this the, is way, great. No. the way you produce God Bless Football? But he'll cut you off some of it. No? Like, <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. 90-10 his way. <laughs> C-O-B. That was a good one, Dan. <laughs> well, I, if, it's got to be good though by whose measurement because i'll let by you, mine i'm the only one there okay I mean, no but no it can't it's got to be good let content. Me check out the wait, class hold wait, on wait we'll wait Stu Gatz, you want to be the arbiter on your He's own roger thing? goodell of course. you want to be like roger goodell yes, yes. Uh, and the yes. appeal goes back to him yeah. we'll get to valerie in a second and, we, and she will decide what does, what's going to happen here when the, the goodell files the appeal does he like put it in an envelope mail it to himself so and good. then open the mailbox the next it's day so like, oh a letter for me and he opens it up oh okay and we then... can't talk enough about that story and just how absurd it is that you arrive at the right thing totally the wrong way mm. i mean think of the absurdity of roger goodell appealing to himself like we're going to go to all this trouble all these lawyers and all they're going to do is be fact finders for me and then i'm going to decide <laughs> uh to run deshaun watson off and do what's going to look like a brave thing which is only also the easiest thing for him to do yeah kind of like you appealing to everyone else who's appealing back to you so that you can decide <laughs> if Stugatz is going well we're going to go to the ultimate authority now we're going to go beyond me yeah god uh, no. uh god beyond that how about Ooh. sam mills i can guarantee you a sam mills yeah. interview Valerie, damn one of the great linebacking cores of all time uh, i mean uh, does it have to be non-jags non-relevant jags on the bonus structure are there relevant jags <laughs> well the, the ones he's going after are he just named them all he said they're all going to be the guests that are going to be at that party Valerie is on the line now making the decision bunch on behalf of, of the company. Mm. Uh, it does. Yes, it is a bunch of yeses. Yeah. So right now the company says, yes, we have to put what about all Richard Seymour. How do you feel about that? Bad class. Who oh. should be the arbiter on whether or not the Stugatz content is strong enough? Because it can't be him. It's not going to be me. So who's it going to be on ultimate final arbiter that Stugatz did his job? He tried. It wasn't just going out there and partying. But you're the boss. I mean, no, he's not the boss. Well, Valerie's the boss. The boss. Are we talking, but, 
Stugatz. Are we talking about Stugatz going to dead shows and mm. that? Are we talking about that or what are we talking about? Okay, well, we're talking now, about the Hall of okay, Fame, the Valerie. Boss here. The, the boss is here. The now. NFL Hall of Fame. Now, perhaps I will parlay that into a little dead show in Montana afterwards, after I get my work done and miss Monday. Okay, and then I'll be back. But that's when I'm off the clock. That's me time. Okay, so let's focus on the company time, and that's me going to the Hall of Fame Saturday. Tony Baselli, I'm invited to the party. I'm invited to the ceremony. I could be a part of the parade. I'll try to get as much content as I can. Uh, what do you think? Well, wait a minute. I've got to give her more information on that. She no, doesn't no, know. No, any, no. Less is more, Dan. She does yeah. not know this and any of this backstory. Who wants to explain it to her? Billy, why don't you explain it to my wife? Explain here where we are, where you've arrived in the proceedings, because she's not going to understand the inner workings of some of this stuff on like, you know, what content is being gathered by Stugatz that is or isn't good enough. So Stugatz, uh, for years now, has been working to get Tony Baselli into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, we go in together. Yeah. So, if I'm there. So Tony got into the Hall of Fame and invited Stugatz along. However, Stugatz has <laughs> grand plans of what he wants to do when he gets there, but also the company is going to be paying for that. Uh, and then everyone within the company is kind of asked, like, well, what is it that's going to happen here? And we're not entirely sure. So we went and we asked a number of people. And so far, everyone has said yes that he can go, but he needs to kind of guarantee content. And we haven't quite gotten to that part. Yet, and you right? you are the arbiter now because you, they say I'm the boss. And Dan doesn't want to say no. And well, and I never okay. say, I sever, I never say no to Stugatz on anything. And I just learned now that he reports to me, which is not something <laughs> that I have ever wanted, but it explains how it is that we keep making bad business decisions when it comes to sending Stugatz places. I'd like to correct that, but I don't understand the money of this part of the deal. Well, and a quick backstory also is there's been a history allegedly of people getting no and then going to Dan and the no's turning to yes, which Dan is trying to prevent wow. from happening in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of, I, I would like Dan out of the business of saying yes or no. So maybe I'll just take over from here. Is that okay? Oh my God. Well, it depends on your Stugatz, answer. You do yeah. not want that. <laughs> trust, Stugatz, trust me when I tell you that I'm married, Dan. I, I know I, I am totally fine with Valerie making all the decisions uh, for me, but no one will get another cent out of me in my entire universe. If that were the case. That's true. That um, is accurate. Uh, Billy, um, Billy, where are we? Stugatz I'm sorry. Go ahead, baby. All right. Stugatz, I would say we're going to need a, if you can fill a small binder full of what content you're going to create right on this trip okay and then we'll figure out what we're going to pay you based on that content okay so i'll have that for you by monday is that okay val <laughs> That's, yeah, that's perfect. No, right. Awesome. No, he I you. like my he, new he, boss. He tricked you, baby. <laughs> it's, it's not fast enough. Oh, it, oh, it's Saturday, that, and oh, there's a dead show that, oh, in there. All you're going to get oh, is receipts. Okay. We didn't say that. We didn't say that. A no. binder of receipts. Um, yeah. I'm going to, but I'm also... I'm also going to... I'm going to deduct some money if you do go to any dead shows during these trips. Right. Yeah? Uh, John Mayer, you're clear then. It's on my time, though, Valerie. I mean, that's that's me time, you know? But you know it makes the content worse when your voice is all raspy and right. Woo! Yeah, yeah. It's a worse show. Yeah, well that yeah I know that, but um it's me time, you know. <laughs> I, it's the Hall of Fame. We do a sports show, kind of, and so I figure the Hall of Fame is a place for me to be. I, I'll pay my way to Montana, the Dead Show, and all that stuff. Is that okay? Uh, so you're not going to expense any of your food or. You don't want her in charge no, no, of this. No, no, no. You, don't, no. you okay. don't want her in charge of Let this. Let me start over. Anything that happens in Canton that gets me to Canton, gets me home from Canton, happens while I'm in Canton, that is, that's on you, okay? Anything I do in Montana, that's on me. Is that fair? That is fair, but I'm still going to need that binder of information. <laughs> Monday morning, you'll have it. Yeah, that's not great on the timing. So it sounds like a yes. I mean, it it kind of sounds like it a yes. It sounds like you have a lot of work to do tonight. Stugatz, it okay? sounds like the pressure's on Stugatz now. Binder. The, the company has said yes, it seems like. There needs to be receipts before he's gone on the trip. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Yo, Hosmer's still a royal. I don't care what anyone tells me. Forever. <laughs> he's a Red Sox now. Hosmer sucks, and he is by far the best first baseman the Red Sox have had in about four years. Why can't your team catch anything? Great question, Dan.
<laughs> catch L's. Don't know. But is this as laughable a, a defensive thing as you've seen in your lifetime caring way too unreasonably about the Red Sox where you guys keep looking yeah. up in the air and can't catch pop-ups? It is. Um, I, I have attended probably 200 youth baseball games from the time my son was seven until the time he's now 14. And I don't think I've seen a worse defense on any baseball field anywhere <laughs> than the Red Sox in July. It was truly shocking. Like the ball, they just like, they did the thing that like seven year old teams do, which is the ball goes straight up in the air and they all like run around for a while. And then they just, the ball just lands between them and they just look at each other like, Oh, thought you had it. It's a, they're professionals. These are professional baseball players. I, it's shocking how bad they've been in July. I and, really you know, admire end of their season. Mike Schur's baseball analysis, and I don't actually want to do this with him and dork out on baseball every time that he calls in, but he has agreed in his precious time to call in every day until he gets tired to do a stat of the day uh, to help us with our daily content burden. And so the you it's are, nice are you doing, is this, he sends these to me all the time. And the last one he sent me was an amazing one on Shohei Otani. Is this one where we're going or you can just keep producing these forever? I have, I have three for you. You can pick. Wow. I have a Shohei. I have that Shohei Otani stat. I have a Matt Carpenter stat and I have a Vin Scully stat. What do you want? You want okay. to spin the wheel well, or do you want to just well, pick one? I, I'm fine doing this. I'd like to introduce this new segment to our audience and if, may it go, may it live a thousand days where you call in with a stat, but you're overprepared for the first one. You, have I can speak on behalf of everyone. No one wants the Matt Carpenter one. Okay. I think it's pretty good. Carp. I mean, it's pretty good. I which one do you like best before we get to it? I like all of them. I like all baseball stats. I can't pick. It's like choosing among my children, Dan. <laughs> start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. It is brought to you by Zip Recruiter, Zip Recruiter, the smartest way to hire. So you've agreed to do this absurd thing. And are you telling me that this is so easy for you that you'd be happy to give us all three of these? Because it's not going to be any problem for you to come up with these daily because they're on your mind all the time. That's correct. All right. All right. Well, go ahead and give us all three and we will decide which is the best didn't of these. You seem that busy. I mean. <laughs> Folks, in 1949, Ted Williams won the Triple Crown. He had a 650 selecting percentage and a 1.141 OPS. This year, 36-year-old Matt Carpenter, who was essentially out of baseball, was cut by the Rangers, decided to give it one more shot with the Yankees, has a 791 selecting percentage and a 1.226 OPS. <laughs> so he's the best player ever. That's oh, right. Oh, oh. I stand corrected oh, on Carpenter. Oh, you're, My bad, Mike. You're, you're saying this is over how many games? Is it 50 games you're saying? That it's, 40, it's only 42 games, but uh, he shows no signs of slowing down. He's on a pace. He would hit, if he kept this up for a full year, he'd hit like 60 homers and win the, win the triple crown. It's funny because I have a Ted Williams stat of the day as well. Courtesy of Tommy Heinsohn said uh, about Bill Russell. Look, all I know is the guy won two NCAA championships, 50 some college games in a row, the 56 Olympics. Then he came to Boston and won 11 championships in 13 years. And they named a fucking tunnel after Ted Williams. <laughs> but that's Boston. <laughs> Splendid splinter. <laughs> Mike, go ahead and defend your your region uh, and eulogize Bill Russell, uh, who you also love, though not perhaps as much as the great uh, Ted Williams Tunnel. No, I love Bill Russell just as much, if not more. In fact, uh, when I was at SNL, there was this big NBC had like a 75th anniversary special that I worked on in 2001, I think. Or 2002, and everyone from every show that NBC had ever made came. Like the cast of every single show you can think of that's ever been on NBC. Night Court and all the all the Night Court, uh, <laughs> Saint Elsewhere, uh, <laughs> Cheers, Night all of everything. Misfits of Science. Every, just, every, just, show, on, every show, he, Misfits history. of Science showed up. Heavy hitters, all heavy hitters showed up. Heavy Alf, Alf was there. 
folks, <laughs> Alf was there. Okay. <laughs> and the, the for some dad? reason, also Bill Russell was there. <laughs> And the only person that I cared about meeting or talking to was Bill Russell. And I, my friend Robert and I, my friend Robert's from Massachusetts, and I went up and just genuflected in front of Bill Russell. And it's the most nervous I've ever been to meet anyone in my entire life. I was my, I shook his hand and my hand was shaking. Like I, I was, it was a, it was a life changing moment for me. Punky the Brewster was ever. there. I don't know, man. Sure, Punky Brewster is there too. <laughs> the I'm just saying, you just said every show. I mean, the second stat of the day is, and you were wrong, Stugatz, about Carpenter, right? I like was that's wrong. A, he's I been Ted yeah. Williams this yes. season. Yes. How this is what is that? I that's mean, just, do it for a full season. Yes, of but course. I mean, yes. But that's just baseball. Is that it? Like, or there, or it's one of the weirdest things you've ever seen in your life. He he uh, he rebuilt his swing. That's what he keeps saying is that he he sought help from various people and rebuilt his swing and. And the Yankees took a flyer on him. And every time the Yankees take a flyer on anybody, they turn into Ted Williams. So it's not like it was surprising. Well, you say but that, but Joey Gallo was broken. Like you say, you keep saying that. And Joey can't Gallo believe they traded him. stunk I mean, for them. Yeah. And then they got rid, they traded him to the Dodgers. Why would anyone take Joey Gallo? I don't understand this. I, like it's absurd. And they, they didn't give up anything. They give up a double A pitcher who's okay. But still, I don't know why anybody helps the Yankees. Because when Joey Gallo the, gets hot, like when he has a month, he has a month. And the Dodgers are banking on they'll get the month. The month is like a 20 homer month. I mean, you know that, yeah. Mike. Yeah, he's just the last hitter. time he yeah. had that month was like 2018 or <laughs> no, something. He's due, though. Bosom buddies. <laughs> was Peter Scolari there? Tom Hanks. I believe he was. Tom Hanks yeah, was there. No. I don't know if Tom Hanks was there. Sid Caesar was there. There's the one for Greg Cody. <laughs> Tell Greg Cody Sid Caesar was there. What was the second stat of the day? <laughs> Vin Scully, the greatest baseball announcer who ever was or ever will be, was the announcer for the Dodgers for, by my count, 24,274 days. That means that in the time that Vin Scully was broadcasting Dodger games, the average human being could have walked to the moon and then walked back <laughs> and then walked to the moon no, again. No, no, and no, then no, walked no, back. that's not true. And then no, walked to the moon can't again. Be true, no. And then walked back and then walked to the moon. <laughs> that's how much baseball he's broadcast. That's how much of his that's, life was spent in front of baseball Sam's games. totally made up. I got to be honest with you. It's true. 67 you can't walk years. to the moon. I mean. Chico, Chico and the man. <laughs> Was was every, I mean, obviously Freddie Prince Senior wasn't there, but was everyone else from Chico and the Man there? I don't think so. Mm. The last stat of the day, and we're gonna do this every day until he gets bored with us. Your last stat of the day is this is courtesy of CBS Sports on Twitter through his first fifty career starts as a pitcher and five hundred games as a hitter. Shohei Otani has more strikeouts than Jacob Degrom and a lower ERA than Garrett Cole. And more home runs than Ted Williams and more RBI than Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> the kid. <laughs> the splendid splinter. Was Meredith Baxter Bernie there and the rest of the Family Ties crew? <laughs> Some of the Family Ties crew is there. Michael J. Fox was there. But Meredith Baxter Bernie? I, I don't think that, Meredith Baxter Bernie was there. Stephen, Stephen Gross, the dad, was there because he did Michael. a bit with Alf that Michael Tina Fey Gross. wrote. Right. Alf was that. actually there. Michael somebody, Gross. Sorry, somebody yes, was, Michael Gross. Somebody was walking around with the 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 costume, not the costume, the hand no, puppet Alf of Alf. No, there. it was a costume. Alf costume. This Alf isn't costume. okay. This isn't really a stat, but uh, it's an anecdote. So the SNL Studio, that? Studio at H, the Rockefeller Center, is very very small. There aren't very many dressing rooms. There is. It's very cramped. It's only about 250 seats. So all of these people, all of these stars. Everybody, Jay Leno and, and Seinfeld and the cast of every show, they all were very accommodating because there wasn't the usual amount of makeup and hair and styling and, and luxury that they're accustomed to. But everybody was like, hey, this is a once in a lifetime thing, whatever. Everybody was very, very nice. The only person who was a pain in the ass was the Alf guy. Oh, no. <laughs> of course. The Alf guy. The guy who, the guy who, uh, who operates Alf demanded a, a, his own dressing room that's and great. a separate dressing room for the puppet. That's great. That a, that's an unbelievable story. Yeah. The Stugats of the puppet kingdom. <laughs> Mike, you need to answer a question for us that's been lingering all week. Do we still have a sweeps week? 
in TV? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I heard you debating this. There is still sweets. Yeah. It is still a thing. Is it in May it's way, still? It's, there's three of them. There's one in November, one in February, and one in May. Can and it's you, the way that the companies set ad rates for the following year. Their, their ratings during that. It's why the Super Bowl moved to February, because Super Bowl used to be in January. Mm -hmm. And then the networks realized that if they move the Super Bowl to February, then the audience, the enormous audience, would count as a sweeps uh, month audience. You guys sounded so. They moved it to February. So unsophisticated the other day. I, you guys are talking I am about. promising you, sure, that we will get you in and out in the future. But I do have a couple of questions for you because you're very smart on the business of television. It seems to be changing at a crazy rate of speed. And I wanted to get some trade deadline stuff from you. But from now on, going forward, it'll just be stat of the day. <laughs> My two dads. Right. With the guys uh, from My Two Dads there. I don't remember. Paul Reiser was You know, I feel like you kind of oversold this event. You just going <laughs> to say that right now. No, it was 21 years ago, man. I don't remember every single well, person he, who Helen Hunt in the was in there. You remember the important people who were there. What? He, the famous people that were there. My Two Dads, not important or famous? Paul Reiser. Helen Dude, Hunt. Put your brain, do, do a little offshoot of your podcast there. I mean, and do uh, were were these shows properly rated oh, or man. admired, or ascertain whether they were uh, properly admired in their time? <laughs> TV phobe coming soon. Give me a minute on what's happening in the business of television. You're gonna hear news today that um, that uh, a lot of uh, layoffs are coming at HBO Max and uh, and the Warner Media Empire because it was bought by Discovery which is crazy to say that Warner Brothers, movie studio, TV studio, HBO, all that, that entire conglomerate, which is responsible for some of the best entertainment in history, was bought by Discovery, which no one really thinks of as a, as a major player. They took on an enormous amount of debt to buy it from AT&T. And as a result, they're 57 billion or something in the hole and they have to slash costs. And you're about to hear news, I think, in a couple hours that they're laying off a ton of people. And it's terrible because HBO Max, for my money, is maybe the, the has the highest quality stuff of any of the new streaming services. And they're going to get hammered because of corporate um, debt requirements for um, to lower their debt for Wall Street. And that's sort of happening all over, you know, the, a lot of these, you know, you read yesterday that Batgirl, mm -hmm. um, the movie that was made for HBO Max, $90 million movie, they're just never going to air it. They would rather take it as a tax write off by never airing it. Well, than can, air explain it. some of this stuff to me because they did get rid of it and the, it wasn't, they said it wasn't because of confidence in the directors. They said it wasn't because confidence in the quality. They said it needs to feel like a blockbuster. And now a whole bunch of Warner brothers stuff is about to disappear. And I think the news that's about to break is what 70% of HBO max is about to disappear. That's the rumor that HBO Max is essentially going to be folded into Discovery Plus, um, which is their streaming service, and that all of the existing shows that they want to keep are going to be folded under the HBO mothership umbrella. I don't know. I don't work for that company. I have one show, Hacks, that's um, that I produce that's there. But um, it's there. This is happening a lot. These These giant projects are being shuttered or... They would rather literally not air them. There, my friend has a TV show called Chad where they made an entire season of the show and then just said like, yeah, we're not going to air the season of the show. We're just going to bury it and, and put it on a shelf because they would rather take the tax write off as a loss than air the show. Um, and it's sad. It's like this is, you know, this is what happens when the ruthless Wall Street capitalism stuff takes a complete uh, dominance over the actual creative endeavors that are being made. And it's happening not just at that company, but at a lot of companies. So it's a bummer, man. It's like they, they make good stuff there. And the, the executives who work there are very talented and they're very good at what they do. And in the short time that HBO Max has been around, they've made a lot of really good shows and now they're going to apparently be gutted. And it's, uh, you know, it's just a, a unfortunate result of this kind of intense merger and acquisition stuff that's going on this battle for um for you know size and power in this new industry and i don't know there's no you know the the first domino to fall was when netflix announced that they had lost subscribers for the first time ever their stock went down like 70 percent. i think that put the fear of god into everybody and now they're all scrambling and they're all trying to cut 
their losses and, and, um, it's a, it's bad for people like me and, and, uh, anyone who likes good content. I don't, I don't want this to sound like this is the cost of doing business, but this just, a lot of this just sounds evil between what happened here and what happened with the CNN streaming platform. Mm -hmm. Like it, this is, this is bad. This is really bad. Yeah, man. I, I don't disagree. I, I, I think that the, everybody has always known the deal, um, which is that, you know, as I, as my friend John Rigi used to say, like, we're all just selling light bulbs. This is back. This is how old this is uh, when GE was running, uh, when GE was running NBC. It's like, we're all just selling light bulbs. We, we get that this is commerce and that, that it's not a pure expression of artistic, uh, creativity. This is capitalism. And the, the downside of it, the, the upside of it is that you get to make stuff. The downside of it is that when the capitalism takes over or there's a downturn in the economy or whatever, they don't really care about the content. They care about survival and they care about their stock price and all that sort of stuff. And so they get really, really harsh with um, cutbacks and layoffs and everything else like any company does. So all of this, um, all, all, this massive expansion that you've seen since roughly 2010 or 2011, when Netflix started um, becoming an actual content creator instead of just a place you went to watch reruns, that has been unfettered expansion for 10 years, and now it's contracting, and I and it's going to be bad for people who like to watch shows because there's going to be fewer of them, and they're going to be pretty ruthless, I think, when it comes to laying people off and cutting back. Mike, what's next then? Because it, w we were promised that this advent of streaming technology, more options, and you didn't have to go through the traditional gatekeepers and now what we've just described sounds like, well, we're back to square one. So what's the next evolution? The next evolution is more, uh, I, I would guess, I don't know, but I would guess that there's more consolidation. I think you'll read that some of these places that are struggling, you know, Netflix has like 55% market share or something in the streaming world. Like more than half of people in America have used Netflix, which is crazy. That's an extreme outlier in terms of penetration for any company. And everybody else has been struggling to try to uh, keep up. And I think you'll see more mergers. I think there's places like Paramount Plus, Peacock, which is my hometown streamer at NBC, um, you know, whatever, Warner Brothers is still an independent studio, technically. There's Sony out there. I think you're going to see more of these companies join forces by merging with each other to try to just take a bigger chunk out of the streaming marketplace. But also what's happening is that people are, you know, the economy uh, went south starting with the pandemic. It's recovered a little bit, but then it's been stumbling and kind of meandering along. And for the first time since 2011, there are people who were looking at their finances and thinking like, well, what can I cut back on? And so a place like Netflix where, you know, Netflix had, again, like unfettered growth. They just outpaced everybody. Everybody got Netflix and no one wants to give it up. But Netflix has also made made some strategic decisions that have hurt them. Like they keep canceling shows before they can get too expensive. They cancel shows after two or three years when people still like them. And that has trained a lot of people to get to not invest because they're like, well, why should I watch these shows if they're just going to be canceled after two years? And so for the first time, I think ever, people have thought like, you know what, I'll get rid of Netflix. Netflix isn't cheap. It's, you know, whatever it is, 15 bucks a month. That's you know, 180 bucks a year. And I just put it down for six months. And when I get a better job or when I have more, um, you know, discretionary income, I'll pick it back up. All those shows will still be there. The shows never leave the service. So I won't really miss anything. And so there were people who were cutting back for the first time since Netflix started its uh, run. So I think they're, they're, all trying to figure out exactly how to make this work. And that will mean probably more consolidation in the industry and more people trying to add advertising. Netflix is apparently going to add an advertising tier to their system. I think other places will too. So the, you know, nobody really knows it, this is, we're going on to, um, I don't know, to into the, into the 10th year or something of everybody saying the same thing, which is no one has any idea what's going to happen, but the best guess is that more places join forces and merge with each other and people start being a little, a little more particular about what they subscribe to and what they don't, which is why it's a bummer that HBO max is going through this right now because HBO max to my money was uh, for my money was like, was the, was worth the, what you were paying for it. You know, they seem to have great shows coming on all the time. The people there have done a really good job of programming it and, 
I, I'm sad to see some of them go because I think they do a good job. It's got depressing. Yeah. Let's let's pick up the mood, Mike. What's the Could budget? Walk to the moon and back. And yeah. What, Mike, what do you think the budget is for the rehearsal? Because we were talking. Oh my god! Were Doesn't talking it about seem the- like a giant waste of money? Uh, how big is that he budget? Bankrupted HBO Max. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> uh, I'll bet it's less than you think, um, because they're not paying actors um, for one thing, or they're paying them very little, and it's really just Nathan and. Um, and like the set of the bar that he built for the first episode, like that's not super cheap, but it's not, it's not millions of dollars. But he transported that, so. across the country and had Oregon. it rebuilt. He did indeed. Yeah. But that's not, that, those aren't the, the expenses, um, of a, of a reality show, which his show isn't really a reality show, but it's in the same general family. The expenses of a reality show were way lower than the expenses of a, of a, um, people, what is okay. what does F Boy Island show. cost to produce? <laughs> Probably like thirty million an episode or something. <laughs> you have what? to pay all the F Boys. I mean, do those guys have cheap? <laughs> That's what I'm sad to see go. Honestly, are we gonna finish the season or not? No. Look, if you love that show, then you're happy right now because you're gonna get a lot more of shows like that. What you're gonna see, reality shows are incredibly cheap to make and you're going to see a ton more of that kind of stuff like that that that's whatever that's what they want like they what these places want the kind of shows that i tend to make and that that other people who make fictional shows um make are expensive they're half hours and an hour long dramas and comedies those are really expensive reality shows are dirt cheap so you're get get ready there's a lot more f boy island type shows coming at you over the next couple of years that's great so there's just a season of chad that was done and will never see the light of day like it's, it's how crash. does how does that become a tax write off though cuz if they don't air it it's just a loss like the way these things work they just write it off as like oh yeah we made this and it never aired in any capacity could so you we just could you get that, that for billy could yeah you- can you send me season 2 of chad <laughs> I don't have access to it, so no. And even if I did, I think that would probably be a bad idea for me to try to do. Can you um, uh, lighten up the mood before you get out of here by just telling us what fired you up at the trade deadline? We've done a very poor job of covering baseball the last couple of days. I mean, Juan Soto and Bell going to the Padres makes the Padres a legitimate World Series threat. That's exciting. Like, the Padres are great now. They have the best two, three, four in in baseball by far. Um, I was a little bit annoyed that the Mets didn't do anything because I feel like the Mets, Stu Gatz's beloved Mets, Ball are, back. are a, a legitimate contender for the first time in a really long time. Yeah. And I, I think my, I don't have any inside information on this, but my gut says they were after either JD Martinez or Nate Evaldi from the Red Sox, and and they thought the Red Sox were going to blink. And, and uh, the Red Sox did not blink and kept those guys. But there's no way that the Red Sox were actively shopping those guys. There's no way the Mets weren't interested. And I think that they just kind of couldn't pull the trigger for whatever reason, which I think is crazy. Like if I were, it's weird for Steve Cohen to suddenly get conservative at this moment. Right. Like his team is actually really good. And there's only two months left of the season. And those two guys would have helped. Like they would have, they would have helped that team. I don't know that they were after them. I think they were. Um, so that bummed me out. But Soto getting traded, I mean, Soto's literally Ted Williams. And Ted Williams doesn't get traded at 23 with two years of team control left. So the fact that the Padres picked him up means they're for real. Their farm system is so good. They traded five of their top prospects. They still have like four guys or something who are ranked in the top 100 prospects in, in the minors. And, um, well, actually, I think they have maybe two or three. But... They're a legitimate threat. If they play the Dodgers in the playoffs, they could beat the Dodgers now. Like they could legitimately threaten any team. Um, and there's a for the next like ten a, years, Mike. I mean, if they stay, yeah. Healthy, well, right. If they sign Soto, that's right. the thing. Like yes. they've got him for two more years. They have to sign him because they've got Machado locked up forever. They've got Tatis locked up forever. They'd have right. to. They'd have to sign Soto. But San Diego is an awfully nice place to live and play, and he might want to stay there. I don't know. 
Um, but they'll have to pay him half a billion dollars if they want to keep him. So who knows if they if they decide to do that. Samson was on um, with us earlier and we got to play the Vin Scully uh, baloney sound, a bologna in his face. Bologna. Because uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, because he uh, very often on on transactions, I feel like he thinks he knows more than he does. And so we hit him with this bologna on the commentary. I said to him that the trade that the Brewers made that hater, you can't you're not going to replace what hater has been you might get something close but you will never again have what hater was no matter what you think of your prospects am i wrong well hater has been otherworldly and in the last month has faltered a lot and no one knows whether that's a blip like relievers often go through even the best relievers go through months where they get lit up so it's unclear whether the league has figured him out or whether this is a temporary thing I think it's awfully hard to replace guys like Hader. Yes, but I don't necessarily think. I mean, look, the the league right now is littered with guys. You've and I talked about this last time I was on your little show here. The league is littered with relieving uh, relievers you've never heard of who throw ninety nine or an unhittable. Um, the Cardinals have like four of them, and so I don't know that you'll never replace that guy. But it was a strange move for a team that's leading their division to get rid of that guy. Mike, you know what the Padres are doing, right? I mean, you've done weekend observations. You You know what they're doing. What do you mean, little? Little shows. Little shows. Fuck off. Bologna. They're going for it right now.